I'm starting. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Hobart uh, City Planning Committee. Um, I'll Sorry. open the meeting. Note that we have. We've got, note, we've got uh, Alderman Zerko here by Zoom. We've got Councillor Sherlock. We've got Councillor Elliott. Councillor Lowberger. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Dutter. Councillor Harvey and the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I'll start with apologies. Um, start with confirmation of minutes. Does anybody want to move that? Thank you. Yeah. All those in favour? Second. Do we need to second it? We don't no, do not second it. But, um, all against? Ayes have it. Consideration of supplementary items. I don't think we. Indications of pecuniary conflict of interest. Does anybody want to have anything to declare? No, wonderful. Um, okay, part five, consideration of items with the deputations. So moved. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. You can say no. Thank you. Um, right. So we'll move to, so council is now acting as a planning authority. We'll start with item 5.1.1, 175 Campbell Street. Um, we have a representative, Ms Fiona Davidson. If you just want to come to that, the middle of that table there. Look, that's that, that's noted, but it is ultimately up to each elected member to decide whether or not they've got a conflict of interest, and for that to be um, uh, that can be raised sort of outside of this meeting. But it, it, for the purposes of the, of the meeting, it's up to an, every individual elected member to um, determine whether or not they have a conflict that needs to be declared. But I'll I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Are we um, ready to go, Ms. Davidson? Ah, uh, yes. Five minutes and. Um, and we'll probably have some questions for you. Um, I'm a resident of Campbell Street. Uh, my home is sort of directly adjacent to the development. Um, I just wanted to, I, I made some comments in my representation and I wanted to voice them here um, based on a couple of areas where the development proposal does not meet the um, conditions, of, like the planning scheme conditions. Uh, I've identified them as uh, P1A. So regarding the heritage uh, significance of the streetscape of Campbell Street, um, I believe that the streetscape of, streetscape of Campbell Street has been significantly diminished over time due to a number of um, developments such as the car yards and everything that have like slowly eroded the former colonial brick and sandstone dwellings um, that were once there and that are now there in different sort of patches. Um, this development is sort of sandwiched in between a few and the form of the facade and its impact on the streetscape I don't think is fitting in that context and I think it could just be like it's an architectural solution that could be revised. Um, the second uh, I, uh, point that I'd like to identify is that the development, uh, the height of the development and so that's P2A because the proposed scale, bulk and form are not subservient to the, or complementary to the existing character of Campbell Street. I note that it's a four storey building at the frontage and it's going to be the tallest building in, like, in a significant stretch of the streetscape. And so maybe that front building um, that faces, is directly on Campbell Street uh, could 
it could do with an amendment to its height or form. Um, and the lastly, uh, I also identify, actually, sorry, that's all. <laughs> um, those were my points. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'll open it to the floor. Does anyone have any questions? Nope. No. Thanks a lot. We'll move on to Thanks. the uh, next deputation. Um, we now have the applicant, um, or representing the applicant, Dean Coleman, Grant Atherton, and Peter Walker. Um, would it be possible, please, to also have the architect, Peter Walker, and Sophia Clark join us for this, please? Peter Walker's already on my list. Matthew Clark and David Fagan from the Building Group Apprenticeship Scheme. They're involved in the development? Yes. Yeah, that's... Yes. Yeah. And uh, we also have a small presentation pack that just need approval to be able to put on board. Yeah. Thanks. Are we all right to put that on? I suppose you don't want to start until you've got your presentation oh, up to you. Uh, their presentation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, you're right. One sec. Okie doke. So just like before, you'll have five minutes. Yes. And thanks, yeah. uh, we'll have some questions for you at the end, I'm sure. Um, so Dean Coleman, project manager on behalf of the Building Group Apprenticeship Scheme, who own 175 to 179 Campbell Street in North Hobart, uh, represented today by David Fagan from the Building Group Apprenticeship Scheme. And I'm going to ask if it's okay that uh, Grant Atherton talks on behalf of JMG on the water issues. Yep. And Peter... Walker from Cumulus, our architect, talks on the height issues. Uh, Realise we have five minutes, so I'll pass it straight over to them. Yeah, so maybe if we go on to the ne next uh, PowerPoint slide, if we're able to. So early on in the project, uh, council staff identified that the site was potentially subject to flooding issues. As a result of that, uh, Flusic engineers were commissioned to undertake um, two separate studies, and you can sort of see Hopefully in the lower right hand corner, there's like a before and after uh, development um, flooding depth map there, which basically one of the requirements is that the development not cause uh, additional flooding upstream or downstream of the development. And for that reason, the, the lower part of the car park uh, is basically an open structure, so it's not providing any resistance to flow Within the, um, within the immediate vicinity. The risk uh, has been identified. It's been assessed by risk uh, management experts. It's also been referred to building surveyors who have determined or confirmed that the car park area is not a habitable space, so it's exempt from NCC uh, requirements in terms of uh, floor levels relative to uh, the 1% AEP flood level. Um, but there is a risk that in a 1% uh, a plus climate change f uh, flood, and um, FLUSIG were fairly conservative in that they allowed 30% additional for climate change impacts, whereas traditionally now we're looking at 16 to 18%. So that there is some conservatism in, in their thing in terms of it being higher than what we think. Historically, the site has not experienced any recent flooding, and you might recall the May 2018 floods were pretty significant to the point where they were uh, determined a disaster by the feds and funding was, was issued on that basis. There was no 
flooding or, um, or damage at the site during that event or, or recent events. The, the main thing comes down to managing the risk that is there. And, and basically what we're saying is that a flood emergency management plan needs to be developed, which will give adequate warning to the occupants to stay out of the car park. Like there's no risk in the, in the building itself. So from ground floor up is, is not issued to flood. So it's a matter of the risk is in the car park uh, and it's a matter of people knowing that there's a flood coming. The Bureau of Meteorology is pretty good in, in that respect these days, so we get lots of warning. There will be a, a flood warden on site 24-7. Uh, we'll have uh, water level sensors in the building which will issue an alarm. We'll have a, um, a security system which prevents people either driving into or out of the car park during those heightened uh, areas. And basically a person that has got, uh, even from the point where it gets relatively like a bit of water coming in to the point where they're in danger is about eight minutes. So you know, most people are gonna be able to walk straight up the ramp or even go up the stairs to the ground floor and they'd be safe. So the flood emergency management plan becomes part of the essential health and building services um, system, which is audited on a, an annual basis. So it's not something that's gonna collect dust and never get uh, looked at. And because they're actually residents of the building, there'll be an induction for anyone who's coming into the building on a long-term basis and is having access to the car park, that they actually understand what the risk is and what to do in the event. So, I could actually go on for another 15 minutes, but I'll hand over to, uh, to Peter to talk about the height issue. Thanks very much. Um, we understand that we're outside of the current permitted envelope in terms of height. Um, we understand that the council is currently developing a draft pre precinct plan for that area that enables height up to 18 metres. Um, and we are in a way uh, disadvantaged, I guess, by being a first mover in this area. Um, However, generally, this area, from what we understand with discussion with the council planners, et cetera, has been identified as an area of de potential development, higher density development uh, for Hobart. And um, we understand that the draft precinct plan is sort of encouraging that approach. Um, the, the height has been largely driven by trying to protect the heritage buildings at the front, which um, we know were uh, demolished in a previous application or allowed to be demolished, but we have worked really hard with the Heritage um, Council officers as well as um, other Heritage statutory officers to, to ensure that that is really the, the heritage values of the place are respected. We've worked with an um, independent heritage advisor to also um, to, to work with them to make sure that the heritage values of the place are respected. And so that has driven a lot of the form. Um, and last, last point would be in the articulation of the roofs. We've utilised a, a methodology um, of having sawtooth-like roofs to try and break up the form. We could have gone with a flat roof that would have shrunk the form, but it would have appeared much bulkier. Um, so I'll hand over to Dean for a final wrap-up. Yeah, with the um, opening two um, images that were shown, one of the things that we've really tried to make sure that this development offers is open area. Um, look, I've noticed in a lot of the developments you overmass the land. We've made sure that this is an open space accessible for all. We've worked with NDIS SDA providers, Possibility and Langfords on having three one bedroom supported accommodation apartments on the ground floor. And also those areas fully wheelchair access all the way through the building and give access to the garden areas while they walk, uh, they come out of their spaces to those areas. So it's mixed purpose, it retains the two heritage buildings and they're utilised as commercial services. Um, you know, the re re review of the architectural drawing so that the, we gave up four car parking spaces to have a deep air planting area. So the trees shown in the render aren't going to be two foot high when they're planted, they're actually gonna be, you know, a good 10 metres high. We want this to be the home for a lot of people in the North Hobart region. Thank you. Um, we'll go to questions. Um, does anybody want to start off? Deputy Lord Mayor, and then oh, Councillor Harvey. Oh. Yeah, look, <clears throat> through you, Chair, could you just say that again, that NDIS um, 
units that you're proposing? Yeah, there's three on the floor plans. There are three um, SDA approved uh, apartments on the ground floor, single bed ones, uh, which also has the provision for a, a carer in the front room, which is also the when Grant mentioned about the flood emergency, there's a 24 hour presence due to that. So they have that important responsibility as well. And they're being allocated to a provider? Uh, there's two providers, um, Possibility and Langfords. It's depending on the client within the North Hobart region. So they're, they're crying out for spaces to be provided. So it's effectively, you know, we'd sit down with the, both of those suppliers and see which are the ones with the greatest need that would go into those spaces. And you'll be giving those units away? Yes. Yep, there will be um, possibility and, and length that are already locked in on those ones. It just comes back to which client is the more, uh, requires the space more. The clients are the per people that the, those service providers look after. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm just, um, I suppose it's a question around the, the inundation and, um, you know, those those concerns that, um, and the report is here for refusal. So can you just uh, describe again um, why you, you feel that, that that sort of plan would be uh, okay, and you talk about a carer in each of those apartments potentially, but is there any supervisor across the site? There is a supervisor, yeah, but we have a, uh, a building manager looking after the body corporate, so the front of the apartment, yeah. On but site? The, yes, yes. But the SDA um, units, they're uh, from a supported accommodation side, there is a carer that's allocated to them. They stay between, there's one per every two people. So the reason why we have three apartments is that there is one apartment for the carer, one apartment for uh, each of the clients. And they rotate through a 24 by seven basis. So the, the types of clients that we would have in there uh, could be, um, have no use of their limbs from the neck down or the waist down supported overhead gantry structure, so um, that type of plant would be going onto the site. And um, and to the inundation, the, the issue about, about um, um, you know, in, in flood um, situations, um, yeah. Yeah. obviously oh, that's a reason for refusal. Um, just tell me again why yeah. I'll throw to Grant to, to talk to that, but I'll just make a couple of points. Um, Obviously, uh, I've been at Richmond today because I'm a part owner of the Richmond maze and we have flooded for the seventh time today in our hedge maze. And each of those times, um, it's not been a one in a hundred year flood, it's just been you know, heavy rainfalls. But through the monitoring that we've been doing on this site for the last five years, there's been no water on the site whatsoever. They when they had the you know, catastrophic floods back in Hobart in 2018, we had two potholes full of water. The key, key component moving forward is that the new Bureau of Meteorology's uh, warning system, which was um, you know, released earlier this year, has proved to be, as I said in my email to everybody last night, unfortunately really good because you know, all we seem to be doing is having a lot of rain, but they've issued those warnings well in advance. Everybody's known that the rain's been coming. There's not a lot you can do about it if you're in a low-lying area and you're going to be inundated with rain for a long period of time. But with this, we have the ability of making sure that nobody uses the car park if there was a potential event. But we're talking about three or four days of continuous rainfall of about 10 inches a day. Thank you. And just one more question. Just yep. in relation to the, the height concerns, um, uh, obviously you've brought it down, but again, um, I don't know that the advice um, from the Urban Design Advisory Panel was was really um, uh, uh, specifically taken on board. So, um, yeah, well, Absolutely it was. It's actually probably caused us a bit of grief because uh, we only had three levels on the front of Campbell Street and the advice from the urban planning was to look at increasing that height to make sure that the buildings opposite, if you go directly opposite 175 and 79, 179 Campbell Street, they're very high because they're up 
on a hill and they, they actually tower over everything. So it was to equate that. And this is one of the difficulties with the North Hobart region, especially Campbell Street. You've got car yard, car yard, meat services area, house, office. Um, and so in lifting it at the front to keep it the profile right, the sawtooth has added you know, another couple of metres onto the height because we felt that that was the only way we could really blend in well with the environment and make it look like it wasn't out of place. And also the poplar trees on Brooker Avenue, um, you know, we've had those surveyed and we presented that to the urban planning team and that showed clearly that the poplar trees at the back are higher than the development. So from the Glebe side, there is no impact looking across back towards home. Can I, can I also just add, we, we had multiple sessions with the urban um, UDAP and we, uh, at every, every, after every one, we um, modified the design to take into consideration their, their um, comments. Um, and with all due respect to that panel, some of the advice was conflicting in, between the, the members on the panel and including uh, potentially uh, looking at and considering demolishing the heritage buildings at the front of the site. So um, we, the only thing that we were aware of that they that we didn't address was that they asked us to make a, a stronger case for the whole of the precinct and we were aware that a precinct plan was actually being developed by the council and part of the reason we understand that they weren't able to give a, um, you know, a more endorsed of the, the scheme was that they didn't have that precinct plan to be guided by. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dutta. Th thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, with, with regards to the flooding, <coughs> it appears to be you know, a major issue. Was there a discussion with staff with regards to this? Yeah. A discussion? Yes, there's been several meetings with, with staff, and unfortunately, some of the staff have, have since moved on, so there's not a lot of continuity in terms of. Um, knowledge of, of the evolution, if you like, but possibly um, expanding on Dean's response in terms of the flooding. Some of the things that we're talking about is um, in, in an event that's expected forecast, we're going to have like a cable gate thing to stop access of cars into or out of the, the, the car parking area. So people would only be going into the car park either you know, for normal things, they might go three trips a day or something. So their exposure time is quite, quite short and the, the period of time that they're exposed is from like getting out of the car, walking across to the lift or walking across to the stairwell and going up. In an emergency when, even if they go in when they shouldn't, there's an, quite a few minutes between the point where water is apparent on the ground and to the point where it comes becomes dangerous. So in, in terms of flood risk, uh, generally it's classified in terms of the depth of the water and the speed of the water and also a combination of the speed times the depth. It's, it's commonly used in, in inundation type flooding like, such as we're talking about but also in dam breach um, studies as well. And so you've got that time where people, even if it's up to their knees for an adult, they can safely wade through that and get themselves. They've just got to walk up the ramp. Um, so the reason we're using the cable gate is that would stop a car, but it won't stop a pedestrian walking up that ramp if they choose that as their escape route. But we're also going to have warning signs, and the, the warning signs will be there permanently. All of the um, occupants of the building will have an induction prior to signing a lease. Uh, there's things like um, uh, insurance. Uh, so what we don't want people to do is think, oh, there's going to be a flood, my car's going to be damaged, so I'm going to go down and save it. So that's why we're saying, no, you can't, because we're going to put that to stop you. And the body corporate is going to arrange for covering insurance for the occupants' vehicles. So there's no incentive for people to go down and do something stupid. Um, and detection signs, induction, um, and as I said before, so once this uh, flood emergency management plan is approved, it becomes part of the essential health and safety features of the building. So under the Building Act, it needs to be uh, audited, the same as like uh, you know, fire alarms, uh, fire extinguishers, all that sort of stuff is audited on a regular basis and it's subject to penalties if it's not done. So. Then let's ask a follow-up question, Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned about the uh, continuity aspect wasn't there. Uh, I mean, all of us here, and I'm sure, you know, it's uh, the project, uh, looking at it, and also with housing, et cetera, it would be a good way to go. But I'm just wondering, would you consider deferring this so that you could have that chat with the, the staff because of the lack of continuity? I think we've had adequate discussions with the staff. The fact that staff have changed a little doesn't sort of change our, our view of it. I don't think that would be um, a benefit. I think the, the thing to realise is the, the, um, the land we're talking about at the moment is, is partially a car park. So the, the risk that we're talking about is already there. We're going to increase that risk by putting more cars in the same area, but we're not creating a new risk. The risk does not come from the building itself, it comes from the upstream catchment. It comes from the inadequacy of, of the piped network to cope with such a large event. So there's less risk in terms of going into that car park than there is in walking across the road. Like, we have traffic lights to keep people safe. How many times have you heard about cars going through a red light? So yes, there's a risk, but you need to put it into context. What's the actual probability of that risk resulting in a serious consequence? And that's where I think you know, the council staff, with all respect, have said there's a risk. You know, someone could die, so let's just say, no, we'll refuse it. Um, you know, we've seen council approve the use of, uh, of e-scooters around the city and we've already seen accidents with that. But it's, it's an acceptable risk. People have got to take responsibility for their own actions. We have, you know, we're looking to have in excess of 50 people die on Tasmanian roads this year out of a population of 500,000. That's a risk which we clearly accept. We don't say we're not going to let people drive cars anymore because they might die. So it's, it's a matter of putting it into context. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harvey, you had one and then... Yeah, I think you've kind of answered my question. Regardless of what goes on this side, it's the same inundation factor. Yes. And you're not going to be dropping the, the level of the car park, the existing car park, any lower than it is now or increasing its height at all? No, it's, it's basically as, as per current level. Okay. And that what did come from advice from council uh, staff early on, not to actually build solid walls around that car park because that would uh, potentially impact upstream properties. Yep. And how does the car park drain? Uh, if it did get flooded, how would it drain? It, it, it basically drains back through the same overland flow path that the, that the flood's going to come from. There is a, an internal uh, drainage system, obviously, for the car park, for, for small events, uh, and there's on-site detention as well. But, yeah, if, if it flooded, it, it just goes straight through. There's no walls or anything for the water to, to get trapped by. Mm. And what currently happens with the supermarket next door? Do they, if, if there was an event that flooded your car park, would the supermarket be flooded as well? Or are they higher? I think, I'm not sure what their um, floor level is, but I think their building is basically solid. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any doors to the... Yeah, okay, no. They divert the water around them, so obviously they, that, that structure's been there for a really yeah. long time. Yeah. Probably one, back to the point about, but that unfortunately we've had a lot of different players that we've met with over the last couple of years through various changes. But one of the key changes that's happened in, in this year is the way that the emergency response is now done through the Bureau of Meteorology, you know, with the centre that's been set up in the Telstra building. The, the levels of inundation that we're talking about for this to potentially have any form of risk is a weather extreme that we would have never experienced mm. before. So mm. I, I get it, but you know, we, we've put five different types of risk mitigation into place, and the, but the principal one the federal government has put into place for us because this, it's been well documented over the last six months with the flooding through Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and northern Tasmania that the warning system worked. We know that there's a lot of water coming. People were able to sandbag. They, the only two deaths that we've recorded in Australia were unfortunately due to misadventures of mm. yeah, okay. cars on their tractors. You know, it's yep. All right. And my, my final bit is um, it, it says in the report that you agreed with the suggestions from the Urban Design Advisory Panel. So, and you, I think you've answered that question already that 
the suggestions they made to you, you, you um, complied with, I guess, yeah. Yep. Thank you. We've got the Lord Mayor and then Councillor Kelly. Um, I was just going to... Oh, it's probably actually a question for the director, I think. Sorry. It is, yeah. Councillor Kelly. Um, you mentioned about the NDIS uh, involvement. Could you just expand a little bit more about that to me? What's happening? Um, well, to explain the relationship, how um, Solutions One has worked with a number of the NDIS providers for a long period of time, but um, David, who represents Building Group of Apprentices Scheme, um, they have relocated into Oaks, which is Oak Possibilities Residence in Lambton Avenue, and part of that is the changing face of disability services. So there is a real shortage of accommodation that's required, and unfortunately, disability is not postcode specific, and so there isn't being enough residents built in all of the developments. You know, well, you know, I'll, I'll apologise if somebody has put some in in the recent developments, but we couldn't see any that that have been, and so we've been working with Possibility and also Langfords because they have a structure that they have clients. They all have clients and there's a, a number of beds currently in Tasmania that aren't acceptable. So we have to look at decanting those out and into newer areas. So we've set aside those three residents on the ground floor. Um, but as I said before, the, the final configuration of which service providers will do them, they work together. They're all not-for-profits and they've all got a common cause. So that's why we put it in there. And the same with the ramping structure that you see that goes to the heritage listed buildings which are going to be um, refitted inside because they're a pretty poor example of the heritage structure but uh, they'll be fully repaired and one of those will be for disability services. There's no commercial arrangement entered into as yet though is there? No, we've got letters of intent. We've right, okay. doing that. On Otherwise the... they'd be just let out as general? No, no, they're, they're, they're committed to be. Right. Um, we've got letters of confirmation between Langfords and Possibility on our on our projects. And um, you're 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 happy with bicycle parking, uh, commercial vehicle access, and all that. You you believe that's more than adequate? Yes. Yeah. We spent a lot of time on that with the traffic management. Um, you know, probably the the good thing is that it, the the way the car park currently operates, there's very little change. All we do is um, widen the access between the current site and the existing site of the wholesalers next door. Um, any provision for electric vehicles or anything like that? Does that come into your design phase at this stage? And oh, the charging outlets in there, that's... Um, um, thank you, that's... Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple. Yep. Through you, Chair. Um, uh, wrap it yeah. Yep. I just want to have a couple of talk, a bit of a talk more about the flooding risk. Um, you spoke about an eight minute period during your presentation. Can you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So going back to what I said earlier, uh, Flusig engineers did uh, two studies which predicted, uh, they basically looked at the, the total catchment that comes down through there. They looked at different, um, different duration rain events and they modelled uh, an ensemble of different um, aerial, as in A-R-E-A-L, uh, events in terms of where it lobbed in the catchment and, and picked the worst event out of that. And ten, it worked out that it's a 10 minute duration uh, event. So with, um, with a 1% AEP, which is equivalent to the old 100 year flood, if you like, which is a term we don't use anymore, because people think it's not going to happen for 100 years and you get two in six months. Um, so that then determines the, the flow. They make some assumptions about how much is going to run off and it's a fairly urbanised catchment, so it's quite a high runoff. So given the uh, terrain model, and they basically get that from LIDAR survey, that there wasn't a detailed site survey to determine what the actual creek or overland flow path uh, shape is. Uh, they take that LIDAR model and then they use a software program called HECRAS to, to model the, the flow coming down. And so they can predict uh, after, the, um, after the onset of the rain of, of that intensity and that frequency, uh, what the level of water is going to be. So the first amount of water goes through the pipe network 
and then it gets to the point where the pipe network can't handle it, starts to flow overland, and therefore they've got uh, graphs in their report that sort of show the depth at the section that we're interested in o over time. So I think after, um, so it actually takes, according to their modelling, 13 and a half minutes to go from, or to reach the, the maximum peak level. Uh, it takes three minutes to the point where you can actually see water coming in the building. And it takes eight minutes from, these are all from the start of the event, uh, to the point where you get one metre of depth. And like, if the water was static, like not flowing fast, then you can probably wade, an adult can probably wade through one metre of water fairly safely. But as soon as you start introducing a fair bit of velocity, uh, most adults would be struggling. Yeah. Um, just in relation to that, there's no, there's no stipulation in the, um, the plan to just limit residents to adults. Is there? There's quite a high potential for children to actually be living in Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you've got children, you've got elderly potentially, you've got well, you know, partially disabled people and all that sort of thing. So uh, again, it's, it's that consideration of if the people are not there, then there is zero risk. And it's a matter of, uh, we talked about flood wardens, we didn't actually say what they do. So in the event of a, of a triggered emergency, which would be when that uh, three minute, uh, when the water first come, starts coming into the building, there'll be sensors that pick that up and they'll, they'll be maintained for you know, maintenance so that they're active and all the rest of it. So as soon as that goes off, there'll be sirens and, and flashing lights and the flood warden will then go down and do a physical sweep of every car in the car park to make sure that there's no one sleeping on the back seat or passed out drunk or, you know, staggering around on one leg or whatever it might be. How do we ensure that the flood warden is on site at, at the time the flood happens? Because obviously these people have lives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like fire wardens in a, in a typical building and, and it may well be that the fire wardens are also the flood wardens and it sort of makes sense they have a similar sort of training. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that's really important is, um, you know, we talk about the onset of the event. For the event to be triggered, if you recall the flooding, you know, three years ago where the rivulet burst it seems down by the town hall, um, and also Newtown Creek, that, that event um, left no water apart from a, a puddle. We photographed it and went through the whole lot at this particular site, and the car park says that. But that event, if you remember that evening, was a huge amount of rainfall, effectively all on Mount Wellington and, and coming into both those feeders. So to trigger the event to get it to what we're talking about for this particular site, we are talking, you know, three or four times that rainfall in the same amount of period of time over a, a, a number of hours. So the Bureau of Meteorology, you know, like the, those radar systems are picked up so you know that they're coming. So that's the trigger for our start to the event. And then that's where we, in our risk mitigation modelling, say, well, no resident is allowed to access the car park. Uh, we'll go, we'll go up. Yeah. Yes. And, and like in a 1% event, like 100 year flood, no one is gonna be driving on the roads. So there is no risk that someone's gonna be out driving and then drive into the car park and then car park fills up. And similarly, if they're in the building and they wanna to go to shopping or whatever, they're gonna they're going to know that it's absolutely pouring down and it's not a really good time to go down to the car park anyway. Um, and, and the fact that we get the, like, you know, we talk about three minutes and eight minutes, all the rest of it, but as Dean said, the Bureau now is pretty good with their forecasting of flooding events. Okay, I've just got one more question just about height, so it's possibly um, just water. Um, the, talk about the height, trying to, trying to make the height consistent with the other side of the road. Um, is the height now consistent with those buildings or is it higher or lower or is it sort of exactly the same as the buildings opposite? Uh, well the, the, the buildings opposite, there's a, there's a range of yes, buildings. Yes, so um, the yeah, the, the height is, is um, it's more than some of those buildings. I can't say categorically because uh, it's been a while, so I, I, and I don't think we mapped every single one. I think it ge generally the, the observation would be correct that it is higher than the majority of the, that, that proportion of the street. Um, 
understand that. Um, we, the, the increased, uh, our original proposal to UDAP was to have, we only had three storeys at the front and they encouraged us to increase the height um, at the front of the, the building because we were looking over the whole site and also trying to, as, as I said at the beginning, trying to, I guess, mitigate the impact of height behind the heritage building. So that's, um, the two, the two storey structure right on the corner directly opposite is very high up. That is still higher than our structure on the front. So the um, previous modelling that's been supplied where it was put into the Hobart seat, overlay for North Hobart shows that. Um, and look, notwithstanding the advice from UDAP, just as a sort of a general question, would this proposal still be financially viable if you drop the height a little bit? Um, in the, uh, if we got the go-ahead, um, like if we dropped it and did it a year and a half ago, possibly. But we've we've seen a 40% a increase in concrete and steel and labour costs. Like David's, the main reason we're doing this is that a building crew apprenticeship scheme, you know, five years ago had, I think, David, 70, how many participants you have five years ago? Yeah, and now you have. Yeah, and because the 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 growth in the state, you know, the, the, they're a not for profit, and so the way that we saw that we could, so it's, this is a development for BGAS to enable them to, you know, that this was an office building with a couple of sheds out the back of it. Now they're in a specific workshop area out in Lambton Avenue, um, but the, the the cost of construction and also, you know whilst the Tasmanian real estate market's still quite strong, you know, the market conditions are that the interest rates increases. You know, we've, we've, we're facing that um, perilous period where things are gonna slow down considerably. Um, and, and probably the main reason we're pushing so hard on the, uh, the, the, the hot issue, because we've, we've talked at length with both the planning department and to the UDAP advisors Awkward, I guess, because the planning department has recommended refusal. Excuse me, uh, Councillor Lowberger, could you speak up a little, please? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, through you, Chair. My apologies. Um, probably my final comment, yeah, that there's, it's a little bit awkward with UDAP saying go up and the, the, the officers recommending refusal based on height. So guess it's just, just a comment I'll make, I guess. Guess how confused we feel. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. We've had conflicting the... Um, you know, speaking on behalf of my partner at BGAS, the conflicting paths that we've had with trying to follow process and procedure has been quite amazing, especially in this flooding issue. And, and I know the personnel have changed out, but some of the conversations we've had have just been um, unbelievable, to say the least. I, I think just um, on that, though, I, I think it, their, their observation, and I, I can't speak for your planning officers, but their observation to us was that it that it's a technical refusal because of the, the current zoning for that area, but the zoning for that area is not necessarily consistent with what the aspirations for Hobart are for that area. And so um, there's been a great lot of encouragement of us as uh, the developers to say that this is the type of development we want to see in this area, but unfortunately the planning scheme um, is where it's, where it's at at the moment. So that's, that's why we're asking you <laughs> The thing, thing well, I, I have one, one, one more point to that. The, 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 uh, the, the council officers report, if you look at it, look at it carefully, they, they do make the point that um, there is a discretion on height because we're above the acceptable solution. Uh, and one of the considerations that they're looking at under that is the con is the context of the uh, of, of the buildings around. And it just happens in this area that there's not many buildings of scale. It's just a, a fairly undeveloped area. So um, the first person to go in and, and, and breach the discretion is being effectively penalised because they're, up, they're moving first. If this development was approved, then an adjoining site would then have the ability to be able to go at a similar height with much, with much more uh, authority. So, so uh, that is recognised in the, in the planning officers report. Thank you. A couple more, and I've got the Deputy Lord Mayor. I'll just say, I know there's a couple of new elected members in here. Um, just, can we just avoid these 
these Q and A's begin being too conversational because it sort of becomes a bit difficult to follow follow with the meeting. Um, and, and just keep make sure. I think there, there's been a few questions. Make sure that they're all relevant to the um, the actual planning application as well. But um, deputy, and then I think did we have anybody else with the with their hands up? I will have. A, I'll cancel a, Kelly, and then I'll have a couple of questions. Thank myself. you. Um, just um, just in relation to the the bike parking. So there were uh, representations um, relating to that, and I think there's room for twenty bike um, spa uh, parking space. Uh, Sorry, is it 20 bike spaces? Or is that the car spaces? Um, regardless, would you, you, would you, given you ride on a bike lane um, and it's in a city, uh, would you be um, amenable to having more bike parking? I think one of the criticisms was hang, having hanging bike parking. So would that be something that um, you could take advice on? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we would be more than happy to look at consider additional ones. I think there's room in the, the proposal to, to increase that. Um, and so we would just work with council to determine a, uh, a number that um, was appropriate. Configuration, whatever. Yep, yeah, thanks. Councillor Kelly. Um, question through you, Chair, to the uh, Director, oh, we'll do we'll do questions for the applicant first. Oh, okay, of course. Yeah. Well, well, what a tidy. No, that's okay. I can, I can let that go. Yeah. If there's no other questions, I've got just a couple. Um, just on the the height issue, because I'll, I'll note the the comment around the first mover disadvantage. But um, there was a question I think from Councillor Loberger about the viability of dropping down that floor. If you were to maintain the viability of it and were required to go lower. I imagine, would I be right in, in, in assuming that that would come at the cost of this open space that you've that you suggested is so important to the development? Yeah, it would, um, we try to ma make sure that open space is quite unique. Um, we're trying to make that a community within a community because um, you know, one thing that is lacking in that area is the ability for children to play safely you know, they have to go all the way up to the top of Campbell Street and then, you know, cross basically into the Argyle Street car park. Um, so, and also really, you know, logs, the poplar trees in the back part of Brooker Avenue are, you know, well planted, but it's not an area you would want children playing in. So that's why we've made such a high area of open space. We also want it to be an interactive community so that it's, people feel part of that, uh, that, that space. And it's been designed so that uh, everybody has their own privacy. Uh, nobody overlooks any of each other's <coughs> properties or anything like that. Um, so they do have their own individual space, but it is, you know, that, that common, I'm really proud of what Cumulus achieved for us on that because that's what we asked for. Uh, we, we didn't want to be um, another concrete block. I'm, I'm, if you compare us to the one up, that's up behind the hotel in North Hobart, pretty different. Just sorry, can I just? Um, yep. I think it, I think it would also come at the expense of um, some of the articulation of the form in terms of, and also um, material treatment as well. We've we've used utilised um, sort of a brick brick aesthetic and um, you know natural materials, um, and as Dean sort of alluded to, it's it's probably much cheaper to do tilt up slabs and those types of things. And so the suggestion there is. You might, if you if you were required to potentially, you could be required to come down a certain number, a certain um, level, but the visual bulk could actually end up being increased, even though it's shorter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just a follow up, just a separate question. Sorry, on the issue of the um, the stormwater, I actually accept the arguments that you've made about the risk and the the the, the ways to mitigate that risk. I suppose the where the issue arises is this particular planning provision doesn't have a performance criteria, so it doesn't give us a lot of scope to um, exercise discretion. I suppose my question to you is a, it's more of a technical question. How have you, how have, how have the, your engineers come to the conclusion that this does meet the, um, sorry, let me, just, let me just get the wording, um, the, the accommodator storm with an ARR of 100 years, when and and noting that the council officers haven't, I suppose, just where's the, where have you guys arrived at a difference there? I don't think there's any difference in the 
um, in the levels or the flows that have been modelled. I think the difference is more about the, the management of the risk. Uh, I think we're saying it can be managed and we've, we've put forward a number of suggestions about how that is done. I think one of the issues that seemed to come up was that floodplain management is, is a big thing in, in Australia and you've seen you know, Lismore flood three times and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of the flood management references that are out there are talking about evacuating buildings, evacuating whole, whole towns, and we're not talking about evacuating the building. Everyone in the building is safe. We're talking about not having people in the car park during like a, a 15 minute event. When they've been told by the Bureau, we've got you know, warning signs everywhere, everyone's inducted into the building. Mm. So I think it's, it's sort of not recognising that difference between a, a single uh, area and looking at broad scale. Because you know, one of the things was uh, the SES won't have time to come and respond to your flood emergency management plan. Because that's what 99.9% .9 of flood emergency management plans are is it's like, identify where you're going to take these people to a safe place, well, that's upstairs. You don't need the SES and the helicopter to come and pick people out of the car park to take them upstairs. They need to walk up the ramp or up the stairs. I've got some more questions about this, but they're technical ones, so it's probably more place for the, the staff. If there were, were there any other questions for the applicants? If not, thank you guys. If you go and can return to your seats. Um, we'll, we'll open the, the item and I'm sure people will have some questions for the, um, the planning staff. Does anybody want to kick things off? Councillor Dutta and then Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to the Director. You know, with regards to the flooding matter and the management of the risk, uh, how, how would you reconcile this you know, with what the information we have from the staff and what we have heard? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd like to call on our um, consultant and stormwater engineer, Josh Coates, um, and maybe Josh, if um, maybe the um, uh, applicants could return to their seats and uh, Josh could uh, take the um, take position in front of the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, through you, Chair, um, I've read the uh, reports and I've now heard this information and the issue with regards to the management of the risk. How, how would you reconcile this now? Because it appears to me that what they're saying is quite convincing, uh, but I need to now understand the interpretation based on the acceptable solution which, you know, is my dilemma. Sure. Um, so I guess the first item is the level of risk. Um, the depth of water that's being predicted is peak of 2.2 metres and a velocity in excess of 5 metres. And when we talk about that in terms of hazard, um, most of the site has been classified as a category of H5 hazard with pockets of H6. And I'll just read out the definitions of what they actually mean. So H5 means unsafe for vehicles and people, all buildings vulnerable to structural damage. H6, which is the next level up, unsafe for vehicles and people, all building types considered vulnerable to failure. So they're the most extreme levels of hazard we talk about when we talk about flooding. It's what you normally would see in a, a, a fast running creek. So if you could picture um, five metres per second, that's, I'm not sure what five metres, might be the width of this room every second coming through. So it's incredibly, turbulent, um, unpredictable type flood behaviour in that location. The next thing is the time. Um, we're talking about min minutes here, and very short minutes, up to something like eight minutes, and it could be less for the time which flooding actually becomes hazardous. Um, that's more the problem with implementing a flood emergency management plan and having confidence that within that time frame, it can be implemented. Um, normally in floodplain management, we're talking about floodplains on hour scales um, and, and longer. And getting down to this point, it becomes a little bit unpredictable whether or not that can be implemented properly. 
I'll, I'll leave the follow-up question. I'll leave it for others. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, the proposed height, as I see in the report, is 23.6 metres. The acceptable height is 10 metres. Going forward, what sort of height is potentially proposed for this area once the scheme review, plan scheme review is completed? Yeah. Or precinct um, plan or whichever. Look, look um, I, I think it's fair to say that the officers have uh, felt that there is a, a deficiency in the current zoning. So as far as building height is concerned, we feel that there is capacity to have a, an additional building height in this location. I think the preliminary thinking around um, actual height um, as part of the precinct structure plan is around 18 metres. Um, so that, that's the um, current uh, thinking. All right, okay. And with regard to inundation, so if we follow the, the guidelines, then this site's probably undevelopable. Um, and how many other zones or how many other inundation areas do we have, however, just hypothetically, you know, that potentially can't be developed because of um, inundation? I know we've mapped Hobart going forward with inundation. I think there's 36 um, overlays for in inundation across the suburbs. So does, how does that impact development going forward with these inundation areas? You know, are we going to eliminate a lot of space in Hobart that we won't be able to develop? And this particular space, how would we go forward with um, any de whatever the development is on the site if the inundation problem um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it is there all the time? You know, how do you resolve that inundation problem? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a good question. I think the in, our interpretation in terms of uh, habitable space um, equates to um, building classification one to nine and a car park um, uh, as proposed represents a, a building class of 7A so it fits within uh, the definition of, of habitable so um, so far as that um, provision is concerned. Now um, to avoid that um, conflict you wouldn't occupy it. You, you wouldn't have it as an, an occupied space. Um, and uh, Including know, a car park? Including a car park, that's right. Technically. So what would you do with that space? Just leave it as a concrete? Leave, leave it as a floodway. That's the, the reality of the provision as currently. On stilts? Yeah. But there's still other areas. In, this, this is a problem that could be you know, um, in multiple locations in Hobart. That's right. And for years we've talked about how we want to have our these car parks turned into multi, you know, residential or mixed, you know, mixed use. Uh, but it's important. Density. Yeah, yeah. it's important to understand that this, this is not all car parks subject to uh, that. This is a um, a, a specific location um, uh, where this flooding. Um, is expected to occur. Now, look, I understand the applicants have uh, put forward a, uh, you know, an argument and that may well be acceptable uh, to the elected members. Um, and, if, and what's the liability if, if this was approved tonight? What would the outcome be if in the event that there was a major flooding event and the tragedy or, you know? Yeah, oh, well, I, I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I'm I'm reticent to uh, um, uh, to comment on what what uh, the liability is. But do we have a legal representative in the room who might be able to comment? And is it appropriate? Well, look, I, I yeah, look, I don't believe I, look, I don't believe so, I, unless Miss Turner does want to comment on that. Um, but uh, um. I can be late. Um, yeah, Miss, Miss Ivey's um, is prepared to comment on that. Through you, Chair, there are instances where councils have um, ignored relevant information that could have been taken into account when they're making a decision, where they have been found responsible for subsequent um, unfortunate events. 
I, I'd have to do some research to provide further clarity on that issue, but I think there is some exposure um, if the council makes a decision against officer recommendation here. And I imagine that's also becoming more and more relevant and intense going forward with, you know, um, extreme climate, uh, you know, weather events with related to climate change in the future. So I guess we've got to be careful, even more so. Yeah. I've got the Lord Mayor, the Dep I've got the Lord Mayor, the Deputy Lord Mayor, and then Alderman Zuko, and then and then um, Councillor um, Kelly. Sorry. So um, I'm just wondering whether our stormwater expert has any sense about um, whether around the country um, where where this sort of situation exists, uh, and if councils approve, and if there is sort of damage to the building or damage to units, whether it's sort of or damage to cars or other things, whether we're the target or is it the developer or is it a shared liability? Through the Chair, um, my only experience other than in Tasmania is New South, New South Wales, which are very much um, forward in terms of floodplain management. Um, City of Sydney, with the most relevant example, um, have a take zero risk, basically. Um, they have a very strong policy on floodplain management. Um, in terms of car parks, they have specific criteria, um, level of service for car park entrances, um, different types of development. So they've gone into quite a lot of detail being such a, um, I guess, heavily developed area of the country um, and lots of um, high rise types of developments with underground car parking. Um, it's a very hot topic for that particular council. In my so you're saying they've got some sort of policy that says take your own risk? Which, which oh, they set the standard for what the level should be, and if it's not that level, um, the development isn't approved. Right. Very clear, and, and, and on both sides, the developer knows, the council knows. So. But they do have quite a lot of underground car parks, though, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the question for the director, because I didn't know this when the applicants were there, did you discuss with them the option of having like a more of a, a void um, that is not, because I presume, although the car parks would add to the value of the properties, it's not, you know, it's the, 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 the actual units are more the important thing in terms of the profitability? I mean, did you discuss the idea of it being just um, a raised building oh, without look, anything it, underneath? Yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not sure what uh, conversations were had in relation to that matter. Does anyone know? Because it seems like that's sort of... Well, well maybe the applicant uh, might be <coughs> in a position to respond to that. Do you consider just um, to avoid the risk sort of not having, like having it as an empty space that um, gets the units out of risk zone but isn't used as a car park and then avoids this trouble? go back to the, a few things that we've offered up in the case of the risk mitigation um, with all due respect to um, from the engineering perspective I've been involved in developments across Australia for the last 14, 35 years and the risk mitigation is put on the developers and there are a number of leases that are signed right across body corporates throughout Australia um, because all those areas are built in inundated water areas, especially when you look at Melbourne. So from a risk perspective, it goes back on to the developer and by the sale of contract, there are a number of tenants that are put in there. One of the other things that we offered up in the risk mitigation is the current pipe diameter that runs through the property, which is used as the flood um, you know, exit path and has been used for, I don't know, 30 years, maybe more. Now, the, the gate cover on that has never popped, so it's never flowed full. So that's, you know, but we have offered to increase the diameter of that during our development, but it's not something that we should have to do for the whole of North Hobart. What we suggested was in similar lines with what's been happening 
on the coastlines of New South Wales and Queensland because of the rising sea levels and the damage that the erosion and the waves have been doing is each developer contribute to a certain portion as they go through, like again with the height precedent with the new precinct plan, we're the first off the cab off the rank. We'd like to be first cab off the rank that gives that opportunity to upgrade that pipe. And so every time you know, like it will be the catalyst for some change because there's a, a number of properties along that area that will you know, probably follow suit and introduce good quality accommodation mm -hmm. to the So again, we've offered up what we think is an enormous amount of investment on our behalf so rather than reduce and have no car parking um, we would do that pipe increase and, and look at mitigating risk but again the, the legal side of it would be fully covered okay interesting and i think the whole of campbell street is has got this or one side of campbell street has this risk doesn't it so so just very quickly one my last question would be um if it was a commercial space or like a commercial car yard still down below and it, this would be fine, like, because it's not a habitable space as such. Is that right? Yeah, well, it'd still be a car park uh, in a building, and so oh, classified okay. as seven it's commercial, the commercial rather than residential. Okay. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. We've got the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not asking anybody in the audience. I'm asking my, our expert because this is what we're doing at the moment. But. Um, in relation to the May 2018 floods that have been brought up, my understanding was that that, that was a, a weather event which affected obviously Lena Valley and um, the, the Hobart Rivulet um, and, and there was inundation in some of those, those low-lying areas on Campbell Street. Um, can you just give um, some sort of background in relation to that as an example and um, are we likely to see other you know, other um, more um, frequent weather events um, having an impact in this area. Yeah, sure, through the chair. Um, so that 2018 flood event was of a specific size and duration which affected a particular catchment size. So the Hobart Rivulet catchment was perfectly lined up for that, that storm. Um, the Campbell Street catchment is smaller, so more subject to a typical type thunderstorm or a localised storm over that area. So it could be a different type of rainfall event that can affect different parts of the city. Uh, and you might see that you may have flooding in one part of Hobart and nothing in a, another location. It just depends on where the rainfall falls. Thank you. Um, did you have any follow-up? No. Um, okay, so we've now got Alderman Zuko. On yeah, online. Look, I have a couple of questions through you to the uh, director or the appropriate officer that can answer them. The proposed height, that is in the central part of the, um, on the side, is that correct or incorrect? Yeah, that, that's correct, Chair. Okay. Um, and uh, in regards to the flooding, we're, we're, our main concern is flooding to the car park, correct or incorrect? That's correct. Okay, so um, I don't want to make too much of a statement, but in, the, in this day and age, we would have potentially warnings where, when there could be flooding uh, through rainfall, correct or incorrect? Yeah, look, there's no doubt that there's an improved forecasting modelling occurring and, and uh, an improved warning system in place. Okay, now, based on that improved uh, warning plan, couldn't we condition the site specifically for the site uh, in, in, in respect of ensuring that what, if there is uh, warnings, there's a, there's a mechanism that, that is, that is, that is uh, implemented uh, to uh, ensure that um, those people that park their cars in this car park Because I think that's what the proponent is suggesting, Chair. Well, that's, that's the, the question. Could I, I'm asking you, if the proponent suggested it, I'm asking our officers if we can have that, that as a part of the condition of approval. 
Right. Look, it's the officer's recommendation that you don't, but ye yes, you could. Uh, look, that's that's the uh, preliminary uh, advice of the officers that, um, as part of the uh, precinct plan, that we would be suggesting a, an alternative uh, maximum height of 18 metres. Right. Well, the, the other point is, uh, in the report, it states that uh, you know that more into the city there is higher buildings. Well, this this site is at 171. Uh, I think 175 Campbell. Uh, the other, I've been looking on Google Maps and, and I drove up and down the street today as well and did all that. The, the, there are buildings uh, around there that uh, could be in the pub up the road. When you look at its roof height, that could be somewhere in the vicinity of 16 to 17 metres. Um, and there's 95, 95 or 93 Campbell. Um, through you, Chair, I think uh, Mr. Clark um, touched on it that um, the issue for the officers is the performance criteria that talks about um, the proposal to be compatible with the scale of nearby buildings. We would not, we would not suggest that um, the building that you're referring to is nearby building. So I think that that's where okay, the officers. My, my last question: Is it proposed to have the whole entire site? at 23 metres or just the central part of the site? Not the whole site. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alderman Zuko. Councillor Kelly. Uh, through you, Chair, to uh, uh, Neil Noy. Um, the issue is raised before about the height. We're saying that, uh, uh, that the, it does not comply as far as the height goes, yet uh, UDAP says that it should be up. If that goes to a tribunal hearing, who would trump, would, what, what would their tribunal uh, interpretation of that be? Yeah, look, yeah, certainly the officers. Um, UDAP was, uh, I think uh, comments around the height issue um, were as from a, you know, an urban design perspective uh, around the frontage, I suspect, and um, and also in, in relation to you know the questioning the heritage worth of uh, the listed buildings on that site. So I think that there were some musings uh, by by UDAP in relation to it. But uh, ultimately, we are guided, and UDAP has to be guided by the provisions of the scheme. Um, further to um, Alderman Zuko's comment, um, for your chair to. Uh, there are ways to mitigate technically and, uh, and what there is as far as this flooding and all that goes. However, as um, the, the legal opinion we got, or interpretation or comment at least, that in the court of law, I mean, we, it's not up to us, am I, am I right in saying for that, to implement a new scale and version of assessing and doing that, would that stack up against what the legislation or the court law is. I mean, is that perhaps turning us into an authority on creating new technical data and systems and schemes, as well as the planning authority? Do you understand yeah. where I'm coming from here? Yeah, well, again, I, I'm hesitant to uh, provide legal, <laughs> legal yeah, advice. Yeah, I'm just um, getting a bit confused on these. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's um, a question of you know risk. Um, clearly, uh, the, the likelihood, uh, sorry, the, the frequency is um, fairly um, low, but, you know, the consequences could be very high, but um, 
It's a question of, you know, mitigate, mi mitigating measures that are being proposed. Are they sufficient to mitigate the risk? Now, um, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a question that the officers have clearly come to some conclusion, but it's open to the elected members to come to an alternative mm. conclusion. Thank you. Um, go to the Deputy Lord Mayor, then I've got a question myself. Nobody else. Well, I'll see if I move uh, the recommendation. Okay. I'll move the recommendation, Chair, um, for refusal. And I have, you know, like, I, this is quite difficult because I can see the benefit and the value and the, the thought that has gone into this application. Um, uh, and uh, But I, I <laughs> um, have read quite a lot in relation to, to um, situations where councils have uh, approved things um, against officer, approve, uh, uh, officer recommendation for refusal um, in relation to climate change matters such as this and inundation. So um, I will stick with the officer's recommendation. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll move that. Okay, thank you. Look, I've got a, just a couple of questions before I sort of properly open the debate on this. In regards, on page 64, we've got, we've got the um, explanation about the um, stormwater issue. And it, it seems to me that the real crux of all of this given that we've heard a very compelling argument from the ma from the perspective of the management of of stormwater of the stormwater issues it, um, is that we don't have a um, performance criteria um, it comes down t to me the issue comes down to what what we classify the car park as is that a correct is that's a correct statement to make yeah look i think if it um, is not classified as habitable um, and uh, um, as we as has been quoted it within the report, I think the the definition within the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme is that it uh, represents class one to nine um, buildings under the building code, and a car park is classified as seven A, so it fits within the, that um, that uh, definition. So. So that, for the purposes of assessing the application. So that building code um, classification of a habitable building is specifically referred to in the planning scheme, or is that just is that a precedence? No, that's um, within the planning scheme. So it is noted that the hip, and I'll quote: "It is noted that the HIPS defines a habitable building oh, yeah. as a building of class one to nine of the building code of Australia. The National Construction Code defines car parks as a class seven A building." As such, not all habitable floor areas are above the 1% AEP flood level. So, okay. I mean, that's what we're going on. Um, Look, I'm happy to open. I've got a few musings on this, but I'm happy to open up to the floor for comment or questions. Oh. Yeah, okay, Chair. Um, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, look, it's, this is really unfortunate that this is, this is looking like a stranded asset, you know, this land. Um, what to do with it? How do you develop it or what, you know, into the future? I don't know. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Chair, if I may. Yeah. Uh, look, we, are, we certainly are doing some work around flood modelling and capacity of the network as part of the uh, Central Hobart Precinct Plan. We've got uh, significant consultancy working on, on that very issue. Um, because the points that are raised are, are you know, are very good ones that uh, you, you don't, uh, just because there might be some inundation, is that, um, at, you know, at a certain level, to, uh, that should not preclude the, the development um, above that level. But what we've got here is development below that level, mm -hmm. car park, and, um, uh, and it's managing the, the risks you know, and the irony, of course, is that it's already a car park. So, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, so it's already a, um, a challenge site so far as that is concerned. So, so, mm. so upgrading the the um, stormwater system, the pipes, mm. expanding that to cope with the maximum flood event um, is hypothetical. 
yeah. or it, it could be done and that would need to be done before the next development application comes forward or in conjunction with or how yeah. would that work? Yeah, look, I'm, uh, look, I'm not sure that you design a um, stormwater system to, um, you know, contain it one in, you know, an AEP, 1% yeah, AEP. Yeah. You've always got to um, have some overland path mm. for the, that, um, that stormwater flow to occur. So I, I don't think necessarily just increasing the capacity of the pipes will yep. okay. yep. overcome okay. that issue. Thanks. Thank you. And um, from a height perspective, at some point in time, there might be a different height that's acceptable in the area. However, we're still <laughs> we're still struggling with the the um, the, the, uh, the inundation. We are. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there, and uh, uh, um, uh, understand that there's a, a lot to like about this proposal. Um, um, there is. Um, it's actually quite disappointing that we we're caught in this situation. So, so hang on, hang on, hang on. So, I, I will. See, so, I'm going to have to. See. I can't. But we'll, let's. I'll, I'll. Okay. As soon as Councillor Harvey's finished, we'll go to you. Okay. So, so unless there's some other compelling debate, like I'm going to have to support the officer recommendation here. Alderman Zerko. I'll get a text of that and look into that, please, because I, I have that way yeah. anyway. There's nothing, pop, there's nothing up on the screen, so we might have to get that it checked is, out. It is there. It is there. The logo's hiding it. It's in his logo. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah, it's in my logo. Thank you. 
the, uh, the uh, conditions of approval uh, ensure that the, the council has no liability should the site be flooded. So I think mean, those things uh, can be implemented into the condition and I believe it could be approved and I say so approved on, on those points that I've just made as, as conditions as to be added as conditions of approval. Look, you know, no matter what we do, what we say, um, even Campbell Street subject to flooding. But look, you know, the, the reality is, um, you know, if, if we if we um, look at uh, and worry about what may happen tomorrow, um, and it's and it's only a car park, hopefully. I I I've got I've got and we talk about around the country. I've got an apartment block in Flemington which was subject to the recent flood. Our car, car, <laughs> car park got flooded. So we got, you know, and it's, a, and it's a newly developed building. So, you know, so the reality is that these, situ and mind you, our car parks got four basement car parks. There are car parks that are happening in Hobart right now, not far away from this site, which are, are, are they're building uh, basement car parks. They could be subject to flooding um, uh, far more easier than this, this particular site. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm satisfied that with, with a proper emergency management plan in place, the Hobart City Council being indemnified and the the uh, the wording on, on page 23, let's be the first mover uh, in this area to have such a fantastic development developed. So I so move. Are you, are you foreshadowing a, a motion? I'm foreshadowing yeah, we, we, okay. Uh, thank you, Alderman Zucker. Was there any other comment or question? Councillor Elliott? Yes, I, uh, it is definitely a difficult situation, this one. Um, there's strong reasons for and against, but ultimately I would find myself, I suspect, uh, supporting Alderman Zuko's motion for approval. Um, from the height perspective, I, the, the concept that someone has to go first definitely makes sense. Looking at the proposal, I think it's a, a smart and well-considered uh, development. I don't think that height is overall... Um, overall intimidating or, or excessive. Um, from the flood perspective, I we already have sites that are already occupied uh, that are really pose, that actually face a similar uh, risk. I actually think that this site, if this development goes ahead, it actually would be in a better situation given that the the lowest level would be a car park versus a habitable area. It's a low number of cars that's in it. We're not talking hundreds of cars underneath there. Uh, it's not a unique risk at all to this development. And if this development was to be seen as being uh, unsuitable because of the flood reason, I would struggle to think of a development that would be suitable while also giving us the efficiency we're hoping to gain in that precinct from a housing perspective so on that basis i would be yeah inclined to, to support a motion for approval yeah thank you very much chair um yeah i'm really conflicted by this one as well and i i do um, understand the qualified uh, recommendation that's been given to us by our staff and specifically that the acceptable solution or the performance criteria at um, 15.4.0 A1 and P2 are not met. Um, and we have them there in 0.2, 3 and 4. Um, so it's, it's really quite a difficult one, I think. Um, and I suppose for me, what's really important is I think when our staff was talking about the level of risk and the velocity in excess of, what was it, H5 or H6? Um, and the difference in the height between being 10 metres and then this proposal was at 23, somebody said. Um, and then um, just the comments that were made from our staff as well regarding the liability, uh, the potential liability of council actually having to um, take on that liability if something happens with regards to flooding. So I'm really quite conflicted um, and it's, it's, it's just failed on acceptable solution and performance criteria on those, on those points that have been outlined so it's with hands are even tied to exercise our discretion um, and I, I, I do understand the points that have been made by the applicants and thank you very much for um, coming and um, giving us your points of view and and I do um, also understand the points made by Alderman Zuko and, and Councillor Elliott so yeah
Yeah, it is a difficult one. I've got cancel low burger and then cancel the data. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I could just about repeat everything that Councillor Sherlock just said. I'm really disappointed, but I feel like I will have to vote against. Um, it's a great proposal and I'd like to thank the proponents for coming down today. Um, my main concern is the liability issue um, and the thought of the amount of water going through there and the potential for someone to be hurt or injured. Uh, it's just not something that I feel that we can support. I would, however, support a deferral if if anyone, if we could get a majority for that, um, to give the proponents a bit more time to thrash this out, if indeed that would be helpful. A deferral is a... Um, procedural motion, sorry. Procedural motion. Um, deferral is a procedural motion, so that does cut the bait. So I might ask that... It expires today, Chair. Oh. So we'd need to get an extension of time from the um, applicants, so it depends on whether they're... they're yeah, would would um, would you go, would would you guys be um, willing to extend the time for the application so that we can move a deferral to try and see if we can find a resolution to this? Because otherwise, the, the 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 likelihood is that it might not get up tonight, uh, might get rejected, or we can defer it and try and find a, a an outcome that works for everybody. But that would that would involve you guys giving giving um, your approval to extend the time. Yes. Very good. So in that case, do I move a motion? No, no, no. That, that, that cuts the bait. So the um, it would be deferred until until when? What would be the? Well, um, I, I mean, it'd be till the next um, okay. commi uh, right. uh, committee meeting, chair. In January. So that's in January. Yeah. Happy to second that, London. I don't think we need. We don't need a second in committees. Um, okay. So that being a procedural motion, I'll I'll move that. Um, the motion to defer until the next planning committee by Councillor Lowberger. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can I say no? That's unanimous. Um, so that is deferred and that'll go to the next... Um, we can't... We don't, we don't really have any right. for further discussion, sorry. But um, that, will go to the, that will go to the next planning committee meeting early in, the, early in January. Or in January. <coughs> I've just been approached by a person who wants to speak at the significant tree register motion tonight to see if they can put in a uh, written submission as they need to go. I'm not quite sure the formality of doing that, and no otherwise they need to go. They're just out there now and has asked if I could ask through the chair if that was possible. Oh, given given that, that, that debate did go on for quite some time, can that be provided and we get that printed off just so we can just have it distributed rather than, I don't think it needs to be read out, but... Oh, no, is it, are oh. they on the representation list? They're just out sitting outside here now. Um, I'm not sure. So I'm just passing on that. Do you want to transfer? Transfer? I think they want to... I'll transfer it. Sorry, yeah. I thought we said the, um, the question. Crew Slatcher, I believe. On behalf of Ian Johnson. Bring that on forward. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, that's, um, that's up to the council, I guess. Yeah. If everybody's willing to bring that forward, we can just bring that, that item forward. We'll go straight to um, the significant tree which Oh, yeah. Could I move a motion that this item is moved forward for discussion now, yes. please? No, no. Motion moved by Councillor Kelly. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Again, say no. No, I have it. So, um, and that we'll move to item 6.1, significant tree nominations. Can we do it in any order? We're going to need a motion to bring her forward, do we, if she needs to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that doesn't need any... Back. I can just do that. Okay. Yeah. Is that a, a quorum? Yeah. Let's go on the quorum. No, don't second. Give. Is that maybe? Her name? Um. Sorry, what was did? What was your name? Sorry. Kim Backhouse. Um. Okay. Yeah. Um. If you'd like to come up to give your your deputation, if I understand that you need to need to leave. Um, so, you, thank you. Um, you have five minutes to speak, and we might have some questions for you at the end. What that? Sorry. So we'll do um, um, Ms. Backhouse first, just because she's indicated she needs to leave, and then we'll go to um, to the Zoom presenter. If you can. I'm confused. 
but we'll do we'll do Ms. Backhouse first. No. So, um, Ms. Backhouse. No. 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 You, you. Rumble Street, Battery Point. Yep. Um, it's actually quite a magnificent tree, um, albeit two things. We don't actually know whether it's a healthy tree and we would request the council arborist to have a look at it before it actually um, goes up. Um, on the register, that's the first thing. We're not sure um, how it's been assessed as a, um, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but nobody's actually been to the property and had a look at the tree. So we're not sure how it's come through as um, yeah, good quality tree. That's the first thing, thank you. Um, and the second thing is, it's actually a walnut tree and my daughter is anthophylactic to walnuts. And we've actually been told by the paediatrician that that worst case scenario, having that tree can result in death. So I'm in a, I'm in a situation where I appreciate that it's a beautiful tree. Um, I don't feel a desire to cut it down, but if you put it on the significant tree register, um, and we've got problems with our daughter in the future that creates a duty of care issue to me as a parent and also maybe the council. So I just wanted that noted. Thank you. Were there any questions from the floor? Sorry. Uh, Councillor Sherlock. Sorry, sorry, could you just confirm um, once again what the address was? 6 Cromwell Street. It just changes the dynamics for me. We're, yeah. we're uh, Councillor Harvey. Um, how old do you think the tree is? I don't know. Um, to be fair, that's why I'd like an arborist to have a look at it. Yep. If you look at the um, if if you look at the a drone drone imagery of it, it actually it's looks huge. quite significant yeah. um, and provides a lot of shading and privacy. Um, as I said, there's no desire to cut it down, but I've got an issue with um, a, a very severe anthophylactic uh, reaction to walnuts, and it is a walnut tree with a child. She's not able to go out into the backyard, um, but if it becomes on the register, um, that's just going to create um, significant issues for us as a family, and I don't feel like I need to relocate or sell the house because of a a tree on a significant register. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, I just need a page so that I know what I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit difficult because it's such a large report. Um, oh, here it is. 1,362. Can I ask you? Uh, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you've... Uh, you do realise that it, to be on the register doesn't mean that it, it it has to be kept if it's unhealthy or if it's um, creating that, just as an application process that just, I guess, is a step in the process. It's not saying that the tree never gets... I'm aware it. of that, but I'm not sure how it's been deemed by the council. I don't have the documentation that it's a good quality t tree when nobody's actually been into the house to have a look at it. You didn't receive a letter about it? Or? No. To read you. I don't know how you could make an assessment, a desktop assessment on a tree. We'll, we'll ask the staff any, yeah. later. Any other, any other questions? If not, thank you. If you can take thank a you. seat or I understand. Thank you very much for even. accommodating me. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. So we'll now go to uh, Mr Donoghue, who's on, on Zoom. Um, uh, thanks, Mr Donoghue. You'll have five minutes to speak, and then we'll have some questions for you. Uh, thank you to the Chairman of the Committee to provide this presentation. Apologies for dealing with the as I'm travelling into state. Um, in, in response to Backhouse's comments on the, the reasons for the trees, because they were outlined in the documentation, Satisfies three out of the ten assessment criteria. Uh, 
area, largely being the uh, outstanding prosthetics, the dimension, and the significance of the tree in the historic town of uh, Battery Point. Uh, probably further add that it probably satisfies further criteria being criteria three, insofar as being old and venerable. Um, I think we're unsure of the age, but while the spread of the canopy and the significant girth of that tree um, it probably is of, is of a significant age, um, and probably dating back to um, some early establishment days, but we'll leave that to the professionals to uh, establish the age and the significance of that tree. Um, no doubt, uh, in fact, I did touch on um, the tree provides the benefit of privacy in a very sort of um, compressed neighbourhood, um, something that we experienced when we did a, a recent extension to our house, and some of the reasons why we couldn't do that is that people in the neighbourhood wanted to protect their, their privacy, which this tree does do significantly. Um, I do believe that the tree is of a healthy nature, right? as I can testify, I've having to clean up uh, the branches every now and then, and the, uh, the abundance of walnuts that fall into my back garden, so it, it does fruit every year, and fruit's quite healthy. Um, in addition to that, no doubt, with, with the current uh, climate-related issues, that does provide a valuable source of carbon reduction, Thank you for that. Are there any questions from the floor? So, um, um, so Lord Mayor. Sorry. Um, so, Peter, you're, um, you're keen to see the same tree that we're just talking about retained. Is that the six at 6 Cromwell Street? Yeah, that's most definitely. No, I, I would like to see that tree retained and listed on the, on the register so that it, it is retained for the benefit of, of, of those who come after us. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you for your time, Mr. Donoghue. Um, I will move on to the um, next one being Mr. Simon East regarding the trees at 20 Adelaide Street and 3 Weld Street. You just want to come Somebody to that, that table at the front there? Can you give us a, a page number, please, if you can find it, for One, 20 Adelaide Street? 1236. 1236 Weld Street. 26, 1326. Okay. Um, is it? Thank you, Mr. Reese. You'll have five minutes and then we'll have some questions for you. Thank you, committee members. Uh, Melanie East and I are the owners of 3 Weld Street and we oppose the assessment panel's recommendation to list three Bataan cypress trees located on our land. Although affording protection to significant trees can confer value to the broader community, this has to be balanced with the negative impacts to landowners who do not support their nomination. In our view, it would be reasonable that a landowner should have the final say about whether a tree on their land is listed. The report notes that only one of the three trees is partially on our land. This is incorrect. As detailed in our submission, two of the tree trunks are on our neighbour's land, and one tree trunk is 85% on our land and 15% on our neighbour's land. However, at the canopy height, the distribution of the trees is approximately equal. The canopy of the trees encroaches over five metres onto our land and covers an area of approximately 30 square metres. We therefore have an interest in these trees that goes well beyond that purported by the report. It's not apparent in the report that your officers have made any consideration of the negative impacts of the trees. They have decided to recommend only on the basis of whether the trees meet the significant tree assessment criteria. I find this disappointing. Surely both benefits and costs should be considered in such an assessment. These trees shade our house and garden. They drop needles and detritus which damage our vehicles. They limit our ability to use the land beneath the canopy. They are a fire hazard. From our perspective, the trees are dark and foreboding and they do not contribute positively to the visual amenity when compared to alternatives that could be put in their place. The trees have been allowed through poor management to grow too big. In the context of their surroundings, the trees are of a disproportionate size, rising above our land to a height of over 15 metres. As the trees have grown, their nuisance has increased. 
Because of their historical poor management, it's no longer possible to return them to a reasonable size through pruning. When we purchased the property, we were aware of existing listings A1 and A2, and we understood that the three nominated trees were not part of those listings. This was later confirmed in advice received from your officers. Therefore, at the time we purchased the property, it was our understanding that our common law right of abatement would allow us to trim the trees to relieve any nuisance they cause and allow us the full use of our land. To list the trees now would significantly curtail those rights. We would not be able to exercise our common law right of abatement without first applying for a planning permit. Even then, there's no uncertainty that such an application would be successful as it would clearly impinge on the purported significance that your officers deem the trees to hold. To limit our common law right in this way is a high power for you to, get, to wield, and therefore, in my consideration, it requires a high standard of evidence when making a decision. The report gives us no confidence that a robust and defensible methodology has been used to determine significance. In fact, the methodology isn't described at all in the report. Your officers have simply made subjective statements to the effect that they consider the trees significant. But how significant? How is it determined that a significant tree assessment criteria is met? A tree will meet each criteria to varying degrees. At some <coughs> threshold, it could be said to be significant. But a documented and objective methodology for determining significance is required. Your officers argue that not protecting the trees will have a significant impact on the streetscape. <coughs> how has this been determined and how significant will it be? To what extent will the amenity of residents and visitors really be affected? If, as argued by your officers, the trees contribute to the strong streetscape presence of the hedge, which is already listed, how is this contribution quantified? What's the marginal increase in significance? Could alternative plantings contribute equally? In relation to the nomination process, which we consider to be flawed, the report suggests that a comprehensive survey of significant trees in Hobart is not considered to be feasible, and instead offers that the public nomination process is well established as a justification for its continuation. We disagree, and consider that if Council were serious about protecting significant tree values and the green leafy character of Hobart, it would embark on such an exercise rather than relying on nominations. I ask that the second and third trees that are proposed to be listed are removed from your consideration as they do not appear to be part of a valid nomination received during the nomination period. And I have emailed you some information about that already, but my understanding is Thank that they that's 30 seconds or 30 seconds? You've got 30 seconds left. Uh, I also request that trees or parts of trees encroaching on land should only be listed with the support of the affected landowner. That fuller consideration is given to the negative impacts of listing the affected trees before deciding to recommend. And I also offer for us to meet you or your officers at Three World Street so they can better understand the range of factors that they've failed to consider in the assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Dutta. Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, I, I have a question with regards to this particular, uh, or the, the trees here. Um, would you agree that the uh, owners on 20 Adelaide Street are su very supportive of this? Yes, that is my understanding. Right, okay. Um, and there is one that is already storm damaged, is it right? Correct. But it's, it's not a risk to the public? The owner of 20 Adelaide Street has received a report from an arborist that says they are of low risk. Um, in my experience, I'm regularly picking up small branches from these trees that fall onto my property. Um, I'm not an arborist, but I have that empirical experience of picking up small branches from my driveway. Thank you. Any other questions? Lord Mayor. So, um, so there's three trees in this nomination, um, and two of them are your neighbours 
fully on your neighbour's land and they support the, like in terms of the trunks, which is the, where the ownership is, I think, um, and they support the nomination. But you're saying that there's the one that is 85% on your land and 15% on the other land, yeah. Um, and with the ones that are on their land, um, do you have trouble trimming the trees now? The trees are 15 metres high. They encroach onto our land uh, at least five metres. My preference is to establish alternative plantings. I can't do that in, with the current state of the tree. So I do have the right at the moment to abate to the boundary, which would allow me to establish alternative planting. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the question so I'm just saying you you can you manage these trees now, even though they're actually your neighbour's trees. You do, you. I haven't undertaken any active management of them at the moment. I would like to work collaboratively with the neighbour to develop a solution that meets both our needs. And have you talked to them about it? I have. Question. So I've got Councillor Kelly and then Councillor Loberg, sorry. Uh, through you, Chair, um, stating the obvious, this is a, a non deciduous tree. Okay. And could you just describe the, uh, the overshadowing effect uh, that this tree poses to you or your neighbours, please? Uh, to my neighbours? Or, or, or to anyone to in that immediate area there. What, what are the ramifications of that? Uh, well, for other people on World Street, it does significantly shade them from morning sun. For our aspect, it is the afternoon sun that we lose. Um, so I, I would imagine at times of the year we would lose the sun at least an hour or more earlier than if the trees were of a lower height. I haven't done sun shading. Uh, work to quantify that, I'm sorry. And the root system, is that extend very much into your, because this is a problem building, uh, you know, the, the roots are taking, it's a big thing now that construction can't have. What, what's the extent of the root system? Yeah, so that was one of the matters that I was alluding to. It, the presence of trees limits our ability to use the land. We can't install footings in that part of the land, for example. Um, so at, at the moment we don't have any structures there, but that is primarily because of the trees. We, we can't. So how many metres would it extend out, just so I can get an idea of how this can limit in the future? The canopy? No, no, the root system. The roof and uh, I am not an arborist, so I, I'm unsure, but I would imagine it's a significant diff distance. If the canopy is five metres, I would expect the, the roots to extend further. I can see, you know, being real issues here, in fairness to you too, for future, whatever you want to do there, this causes a big problem. No further questions, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Lowe, Thank you. Uh, just through you, Chair. Um, what are you seeking from us today? Are you asking us not to list the fir tree that's on your property, or are you asking for all of them to potentially not be listed? Uh, my concern is that my common law right of abatement would be derogated by the listing of the trees. So I'm trying to preserve that right. So I can choose to abate the trees to the boundary if I can't find an alternative resolution with the owner of 20 Adelaide Street. So, so you'd like us to not list even the trees that are on their property? Correct. Even though they're their trees and they support it? Yes, they are their trees in terms of the definition in the uh, Neighbourhood Disputes About Plants Act, but they are certainly <coughs> trees in our backyard that we have to live with on a day to day basis. I'm just, I'm still a bit unsure about why it'll change your current situation. Because we wouldn't be able to abate the trees to our boundary. And you do that now, though? No, we don't oh, do it at the moment. We haven't, but that option is open to me at this time. That, that's right. I, well, 
No, I, I said I would first have to apply for a, a permit under LUPA, and it's my feeling that such an application wouldn't be successful because it would certainly impinge on the very values that you would list the trees for. One final question. Councillor Elliott. Um, are you aware that the permit application fee is $770? Yes, I am, and I think that's a significant burden to uh, place on me if I did want to explore that possibility of pruning the trees or um, doing anything else in relation to the Thank trees. You. Other questions? Thank you for your time. We'll move on to the uh, next deputation, which is Annette Moore in regards to the same trees. Thank you, Ms Moore. You'll have five minutes to speak and then we'll probably have some questions for you. Hi, thank you for your time. As you know, I'm the owner of 20 Adelaide Street, South Hobart, and I nominated the three trees for the inclusion of the significant tree register. Two of the trees are fully on my property and one is a shared tree. I strongly dispute that the shared tree, as noted in the opposed submission, that states that the tree on the border between 20 Adelaide Street and 3 World Street is 15% um, within 20 Adelaide Street and 85% within 3 World Street, and that the canopy extends further into World Street than 20 Adelaide Street. Legal correspondence refers to shared tree, not a percentage of tree. I can further, and I'll go through this and then I'll further talk to um, the position of the trees in the canopy and of how some of the canopy has been cut back, despite what my neighbour has just said. This picture depicts what the tree actually looks like now. So there has been some cut out, but it is in the inclusion for the submission. I fully agree with the panel's response to the opposed and of their recommendations for the inclusion of the trees into the register of the significant trees that have been listed as category one, trees of outstanding access, sorry, aesthetic significance, category five, trees that are recognised as a significant component of a natural landscape, historic site, town, park or garden. Category six, trees that have local significance. I also agree with the letter from South Hobart Progress Association that is in support of including the three nominated trees to the register of significant trees. I note further, I note that the opposed in their submission and response to the nomination have referred to some other matters of concern that had previously been raised directly with me by the opposed and that have subsequently been addressed against relevant laws required of a landowner. Complaints were assessed against serious injury to a person on another area of land, serious damage to another area of land or any property on another area of land and substantial ongoing and unreasonable interference with the use of enjoyment of another area of land. I refer to this document now that notes that, that the only legal recommendation was to obtain an arborist report in which I did um, that was to mitigate the risk or that related to potential serious injury to a person on another area of land. The report indicated that the, tre the, trees, the three subject trees appeared healthy and stable with a acceptable risk. Other claims from the proposed were unsuccessful as it relates to the use of enjoyment of land, serious damage to property and preventing the use of the land. So some of the things that were, were um, addressed that I sought um, legal advice on, so this is, this is <coughs> legal advice that I had here. So the complaints of dropping needles, pollen, sap and other debris which damaged and the, paint on the vehicles, damage seals and cause corrosion or mould, which incidentally, um, when pine needles drop, they lose their acidity. Um, so I've never had any issue with, with um, damage from uh, um, corrosion from any pine needles. As to have I had, yes, there has been one limb of a tree 
um, some years ago in a storm, and that has been addressed um, within the um, submission that um, has fallen out. But there's the, the, that has not um, changed the integrity, integrity of the tree. Um, further um, complaints were um, prevents the growing of plants beneath the overhang of these trees on, on the property. So the re relevant obligation was substantial, ongoing and unreasonable you've got interference. 30 abuse. seconds left, so if you could, if you could wrap up. Sorry? There's 30 seconds left, okay. so if you could wrap so, up, please. Okay, so moving on, I'll move on to some photos that, that depict that this, this is the trees. Um, so um, this depicts why there is good reason to believe that it was an omission that these trees were mistakenly omitted from the original significant tree register for this group of trees, refer to the Ho South Hobart Progress Association letter of support, negates the claim of, of only visual view being limited to a small section of World Street. This photo was taken from Adelaide St Street, raises the question to why it was accepted by the opposed that the existing listed hedge contributed to the yep. streetscape, Thanks. but the three nominated trees don't. The three nominated trees are included in that. Thanks a lot. That's, that's time. Um, uh, if, if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Um, just the piece you were reading out about legal advice, the, what you were reading out to us with the table with the legal advice, was that related? Did you get a complaint um, under the neighbouring no, trees no, nuisance? Um, it was um, uh, my neighbour directly, Simon. Um, um, presented with this, I sought legal advice. So it wasn't under that um, new state legislation, the Nuisance Neighbouring Trees Act? Yes. Oh, it was? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it wasn't? No. OK. <laughs> All right, no worries. Councillor Dutta. Uh, Chair, just... I'm just seeking clarification from you first to begin with. I uh, just want to follow up that. Is it OK to ask or is it appropriate to ask, you know, which legal advice or which particular or is that not appropriate? Sorry, ask that again. Uh, the, the question is, you know, there's a legal advice, and I just wanted to know who from, who, who uh, you know, who, which was the source of that advice? Oh, yeah, I'll ask, yeah, ask it, yeah. Is it? Yes. Oh, thank you. Can I, can I then ask you, so where, where did you get the information from, which legal firm? Um, Brown, um, um, Brown, Fitzgerald, um, Fitzgerald and Brown. You, you don't have it there with you. Um, I have the, I have, I have this. That's what that was. That's Come correspondence on. sent to me. I might have another. I might be able to find something that has. Yeah, in the in the meantime, are there any other questions? I do have it. If you, if I, I'm happy to. This, this, this is the email that contains. So, but, so I guess, yeah. To clarify, so you, you, the two of you, have had some previous disputes about this, um, these trees, before yes. before this, and you've exchanged yes. various legal um, yes. opinions and things. Yeah. So there, there it is. Fitzgeralds and Brown. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Councillor Kelly. Um, How long have you been a resident here for, if you don't um, mind me asking? For around 20 years. Are you able to say how long your neighbours have been there for? Um, I think around April 2016. So the trees were well established when Mr East moved into the heritage um, precinct of South Hobart. Um, Councillor Loberger, did you have your hand up? Or uh, sure. No, oh, Councillor no. Kelly just asked my question. So oh, OK, all good. Um, any other questions? <laughs> no. Thank you for your um, your time. We'll move on to the next one, which is Prue Slater on behalf of Ian Johnstone. The trees at Two Church Eleven U. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you'll have five minutes, and we'll have some questions for you at the end. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm representing um, Ian Johnson, who nominated a number of trees for Two Church and Avenue. Um, Ian wasn't sure whether he could come to the meeting tonight, but uh, he has. But um, 
I'll proceed with representing him anyway. Um, Churchill Avenue uh, is the Sandy Bay campus of UTAS. And in December 2021, Ian Johnson nominated approximately 40 trees <coughs> on the neighbouring campus of UTAS for the Hobart City Council Significant Tree Register. Um, of these nominated trees, the Hobart City Council's Tree Assessment Panel recommended listing 13 of them, approximately one third. The owner, UTAS, initially rejected all of the council's recommendations except one on the basis that the trees did not fit their proposed master plan for the site. UTAS has since withdrawn its application for rezoning of the site to accommodate the proposed master plan. However, one month after their initial response, a subsequent letter from UTAS supported listing five of the council's recommended 30, 13 trees. And at this stage, <coughs> UTAS's application for the rezoning was still current. So we agree with and we're fully supportive of the council's recommendations for listing of the 13 recommended trees. However, we do feel that a further two from the original nominations by Ian Johnson are worthy of consideration by the Hobart City Council panel. And these are Eucalyptus Morris B.I. Uh, there are two trees, which was part of no uh, nomination number 20, and Vagus Sylvatica purpurea, which was number 37. Um, I'll just give you a brief, brief description of the trees and, and why we think the council should um, consider them for listing as well. So num number 20 is actually a native garden of 12 trees. And two of these trees are Eucalyptus morrisbii, one of the rarest eucalypts in Australia, known for only two populations in Hobart. These trees are capable of meeting categories four, five, and seven. Category four, uh, one of the trees is associated with a conference on eucalyptus genetics, which was held at UTAS in 2019, during which its genome was sequenced. It is a reminder of this event and reinforces the university site as a place of research. In category five, these two trees are the most significant components of an attractive native garden on the UTAS campus. The garden contains other less significant trees, shrubs and grasses, and does provide food and habitat for native fauna. Category seven, um, Eucalyptus morrisbii is extremely rare and known only from two locations in southeast Tasmania. Fewer than 30 trees are known to exist in the wild, so it's facing imminent extinction in the wild, and it is listed as endangered under the Tasmanian Threatened Species Protection Act. And there are two specimens of this rare eucalyptus in the native garden. <clears throat> there's, there's actually a plaque uh, beside one of the trees describing this. Um, the second tree that we would like the council's panel to reconsider is the Phagus sylvatica purpurea of the purple beech. And this very distinctive tree is one of the earlier plantings on the campus and was planted in memory of a professor of English. It's capable of meeting categories one, four, six, and seven. For category one, the purple beech has an unusual and very distinctive deep purple colored foliage, which turns coppery red in autumn. The elliptical leaves are lustrous and the tree has smooth gray bark. And these attribu at attributes give the tree its outstanding aesthetic significance. Category four, its cultural significance, the tree was planted in memory of Professor Albert uh, Booth Taylor, an Oxford graduate and Professor of English at UTAS from 1926 to 1957. It has cultural significance. You've got 30 seconds left, so if you could wrap up, please. Sorry? You've got 30 seconds left. Right. Yep. Okay, so um, category six, this tree is appropriate plan appropriately planted outside the Arts Lecture Theatre in memory of the professor, and it reinforces this site as a place of learning. So it has local significance. Category seven, it is actually an unusual and relatively rare tree in Tasmania, so it's at local significance. Um, so in conclusion, we request that the um, Hobart City Council's Tree Assessment Panel reconsider these two nominations for listing on the significant tree register, and we're fully supportive of the other 13 trees recommended by the Hobart City Council for listing, 
and we encourage you as elected members to also support these recommendations by your staff. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions? Councillor Loberger, and then the Lord Mayor. Just through you, Chair, um, how many trees did you actually nominate in total on this site? Well, Ian nominated, I think it was actually close to 60 originally, but then he withdrew some. He discovered that some were already listed. Um, so it was approximately, ended up being approximately 40. Approximately 40. Some were in groups, so we, if there was a group. Nominations for some were grouped. Yeah. Yep. Um, and how many of those applications did UTAS, how many did UTAS refuse? Um, well, about two thirds. Thank you. Did they uh, refuse them or did our panel not, sorry? Yeah, Lord Mayor. Did our panel not find them, like, they, they didn't, our panel wasn't very generous with the nominations were they? Uh, well the panel checked them all out and and thought they didn't meet the criteria significantly sufficiently. Um, yeah. So then it came down to just the 13 and then UTAS said not even those 13. But yeah. we, we just think that these two additional yeah. nominations should be so, so basically if we were to accept your recommendation it would go We'd, we'd, uh, we'd go with the 13 trees that our staff recommend and your two nominations as well, which would be, um, is it 12 trees in um, 20? Well, it's is really it? just the two within that grouping of 12. But the nomination of 20, like it, the whole, the whole. Um, it's the, the whole, it was a, the whole it grouping really of trees. was a native garden that you nominated, yes, wasn't it? Yes, it Rather was a native than, garden. It's a, Delightful um, native garden uh, between the chemist, between the physics build, no, between the chemistry building and the Morris Miller Library. Okay. Um, and was there a reason you didn't go um, above Churchill Avenue at all? I, I didn't assess above Churchill Avenue. And do you have any sense about whether any of those are all that gully is? Ah, uh, okay, the gully. That's the. I think what you're. And above, just above Church Avenue, really. Well, uh, I I didn't assess it. I know a lot of people are very interested in that area. I would I would think there would be um, trees, perhaps of significance, but I'm not a landscape architect. I can't really say that with any authority. I might ask our staff whether any of those are already listed. I, th I think there would be um, a number of significant habitat trees in the gully, swift parrot habitat, the blue gum and um, black gum. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We've actually got a question from the, the director, I think, seeking some clarification. Yeah, sorry, uh, Prue. I, I, I missed the uh, reference number to those two. Um, uh, 20 is the, the Eucalyptus Morris B.I. And then two, two of them, and 37 is the Purple Beach. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Harvey. Yeah, could you just repeat, please, um, when the Murrisby were planted? When, um, I'm not sure. Um, they're not terribly big. Um, I don't know, Ruby, I don't know whether you know them. Yeah, they're probably about yeah three to four metres tall. Mm. Maybe yes. So it's easy to kind of overlook them because they're relatively very important but straggly looking trees yes. sometimes. Yeah. Yes, it's it's a fairly um, bushy area and. Mm. Um, um, mm -hmm. Yes, easy to overlook. And, and it's the plaque there beside one of them that, um, I, I noticed they were unusual, but it was the plaque that, that sort of really brought it to our attention, how rare they are. Yep. Now we actually, we found one in um, Bridgewater at Green, um, Green Point, which was quite a surprise. But, hmm. 
Any other questions? No. Thanks a lot for your time. We'll move on to, I think we've got one more, because uh, Richard Metcalf has withdrawn, so we've just got, just got Jeff Lang via Zoom. You see, he is here. Mr. Lang, um, you'll have five minutes and then we'll have some questions for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, I'm um, so apologies for being online on my own time with COVID. But um, some of you uh, may not know me, so I, I, I work for the City of Hobart as the manager of city infrastructure. So I'm representing here as, as the manager of the road infrastructure. So we've got, uh, we've got concerns with several uh, listing uh, with the trees and forest road and Federal Street. Um, and I just want to outline to the committee and the council just the risks associated with listing these trees uh, in the road reserve. Uh, so firstly, I just want to highlight that the council is the, the road authority and has an obligation to provide safe roads and footpaths. But I just have some concerns regarding listing trees, in, particularly in Federal Street. Um, these are, are, are London plane trees planted in the, in, in the footpath, so there's no major or anything like that. So we, we've had uh, ongoing problems with maintenance issues around uh, main, uh, tree repeats and uh, causing trip hazards in the footpath and some heaving in the road. So we've had our staff in there to, uh, to fix that up. Uh, I'm concerned, I guess, one day uh, the tree roots are going to get too big uh, and we will not be able to remove them without killing the trees. So listing them as significant trees may, uh, may cause the council to make a choice between, or not, may not be able to remove the trees and, and, and we may not be able to provide a safe footpath. Uh, the other issue, uh, some elected members may be aware that uh, fronting property owners have complained about these trees in the past. There's been concerns around roof damage, uh, to, uh, to, to roof damaging the buildings, and also uh, concerns around uh, leaves in the, in the gutters. Uh, the other, the final risk is, is the council uh, may be limited to future sort of uh, uh, options regarding uh, orientation of the road and footpaths and, and bike lanes and that sort of thing if, if the trees cannot be uh, removed or related, relocated to a different area. So uh, that might really limit council's options in, in perpetuity if we uh, decide these are a significant trees. So, uh, so, so this is for Forest Road and Federal Street, Jeff. Just some concerns around that, and I just want to let the, uh, the, the committee know some of the risks uh, in, in, in regards to roads and road maintenance. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Dutta. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Just through you. Um, now, with regards to the comment made that uh, you know these trees can be damaging to the building, so if the trees are damaging to the building of a ratepayer, um, is the city council or the council is liable for that? Was that a question for me, Chairman? I, uh, yes, yeah. uh, I, I don't know. We, we potentially could be. Um, uh, I think Ms. Wilson might be able to answer that a bit better than me. Um, but they, I, I'm not saying they have damaged the building. I'm just aware there's been complaints about that. Oh, no, We might move. We might do questions of yeah, you so after. Yeah. So, um, uh, we've got the Lord Mayor and then Alderman Zuko. Uh, I'm just moving to um, number seventy-five, which says here um, city that? mobility uh, reference number n nomination number seventy-five, which it says city mobility Proposed has expressed or is it for us Federal Street or? No, it's oh. neither. But it's are you involved in that one as well, Jeff? The um, it says here C city mobility unit expressed concerns about um, 44 trees on Hewen Road and Hilborough Road in intersection. Uh, uh, I, I haven't uh, looked at any concerns with those ones, but city mobility may have got some concerns with uh, but it's not much. Okay. Yeah, so it's just those two. All right. Um, okay. Any other questions? Council Logan. Uh, just through you, Chair. Um, if we were to remove these trees, I'm just, just checking whether we would replace them and what we would replace them with. Council, we, 
Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. Alderman Zeko. Yeah, Mr Lang, is there any um, um, council infrastructure that's been damaged in these trees in, um, in Federal Street? Currently. Uh, uh, through the chair, yes, the, the footpath, the curves. The uh, gutters. Uh, the gutters. That's right. That's right. Ken. Uh, well, you know, like, uh, if anyone's been down, down that area, uh, I know that area quite well. Um, the, the whole section from, from really the pub right through to the car yard is actually um, the whole, everywhere the gutter is damaged. I was sent photos of people uh, tripping over the, uh, the footpath uh, because of the, uh, the damage to the footpath, how high it is. And um, I don't want to sort of have a debate with Mr. Lang, but there I have actually uh, taken photos of damage to the, to the property there because the property owners have contacted me. Is there, is there another question? Is there another question? Many years ago in Sandy Bay. Another question there, Alderman Zuko? Oh, sorry. Just, yeah, we're just still in question time. Yeah. Sorry about that. Are there any other questions of Mr. Lang? No, look, thank you for, for your time, Mr. Lang. We'll, um, I think that's the end of them. So we've got the, the item. I'm happy. Does anybody care to open that up? With um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to... Um, I'd like to have some questions to um, yeah. our, our head of our arborist team, is it? Yeah, if we can. Before yeah, we'll get... get can, do you want to come up? And, and, and Sandra and, and Nick, Sandra. Nick Booth, who were, um, was also on the, on the panel. Yep. Um, so it may be prudent to have all three, Chair. Um, so just starting, I guess, mainly with the um, questions, other items we've had before us tonight. Um, I guess starting with the first one. Um, six, Cromwell, six. six. Oh, sorry, no, not six Cromwell, the second one. 20 Adelaide. 20 Adelaide. Um, just on this issue around the trimming of trees and what the change would be in terms of a nomination if you're a um, if you're a neighbour and you're trimming. I mean, does the nomination prevent reasonable trimming, or does it sort of like is it um, is, is there a sort of um, point at which an application is triggered and a point at which it's not triggered? Yeah. So it's uh, it's not. Uh, specifically outlined that you can't prune X size branches or X, you know, percentage of the canopy. Um, however, the way that we've interpreted that in the past is that if the pruning is for the general health of the tree, doesn't distort the form and meets generally the Australian standards for pruning of amenity trees, then a permit wouldn't be required. If you wanted to uh, change the form of the tree dramatically, wanted to, to lop the height or remove, you know, half the canopy, then that would be considered to be significant enough that you would need a permit. So just sort of general reasonable trimming is not going to be captured by this. No. So and, it would have to be a dramatic change to the form of the tree. Otherwise, life doesn't change in terms of trimming. Yeah, and that's certainly not the intent that uh, having a tree listed would prohibit you from undertaking maintenance on trees. That's certainly encouraged still. All righty, that was all on that one. I did want to ask about the UTAS uh, nominations because my understanding is there were 40, well, there was the 40 nominations. It then, then the initial assessment, you um, agreed with 13 nominations or the panel agreed that 13 nominations fit the criteria but then have we are you still proposing that the 13 nominations go forward or have we said have we agreed with the UTAS objections and now we've only got five nominations uh, I think we looked further into a few of them so there was um, two white gum trees that we had assessed by an independent arborist and and agreed that they were in decline and so probably not worth listing those two. Yeah. Um, and there was the oak, there was um, reference, 
uh, 18, the English oak. And uh, following review, it was the, the panel recommended that that tree stop first. Yeah, it just seems like um, uh, it seems a shame that we've sort of gone down from 13, our original 13, to down to just the five. Is it five missing or five missing? Uh, five nominations, yeah. yeah. So w would it be, um, were there some that are borderline that you think maybe if, well, the we should, or are you pretty clear about the do not list? <coughs> yeah, so the ones, uh, so I guess from the panel's perspective, <coughs> there were just the two white gums that we recommended not to pursue because of um, the independent arborist recommendation. And then the only other one that was borderline was that English oak. Um, so I don't think there were any other changes. So really, we if we went with the um, 11 nominations that from the original 40. And would that include the 20 and 37 or not at all that, that the representation talked about? So they weren't included in the recommendations okay. from the panel. Um, if the but that'd have to that be additional. They yeah. would, if that's... Okay. Um, um, oh, right. Sorry. Was that all, Lord Mayor? Uh, sorry, just the one more on. I'll just, um, I guess, a response to your colleagues, um, the co concerns raised by the colleagues about um, Federal Street, because I see that um, the panel says no, they still, you know, despite those um, oppo opposition of the city infrastructure, um, you propose that we still do list them. Um, so is that just because you don't think the concerns raised are legitimate or you think that the tree value is sort of outweighs the concerns or? Uh, I certainly don't want to um, conflict with anything that Jeff said. I think what this raises is that there are competing interests in these areas and what's important I think is to uh, take the, so the, it was a panel, an expert panel that were looking at these trees um, in relation to the criteria of the significant tree nominations, which is separate really from our and roles trenches. on council. Do you think some of the issues raised are manageable with these trees or are they really, like yeah. in terms of the, how would we fix footpaths now that these trees are very established, for example? Um, so we do have significant trees on council land nominated throughout the city. I don't know the exact numbers, but I would almost suggest that they're the, the majority of trees that are on the significant tree register. Uh, so from a management perspective, I guess it, it's an indication that, um, that these trees are of higher significance and do deserve additional consideration, potentially additional um, uh, costs spent on them to maintain the infrastructure around them and to perhaps invest in alternative solutions to ensure that you can still get those footpaths that are safe um, while maintaining the trees at the same time. But is it, is it physically or practically, if, you, if we did spend more money, we recognise them as significant trees and we say now well, here's some extra money to, ma is it physically possible to fix? Yes, yes. So how do you, um, very briefly, like in one sentence, how, how do you fix? Raised, yes, so um, we're, roots oh, on footpaths, so. uh, we're looking at different treatments for the, the types of surfaces that we put down. So there are, there are a range of different treatments and there's um, research going into this issue both throughout Australia and throughout the world because obviously urban trees are everywhere and the, the issue of footpaths are everywhere as well. So the issue of roots and, and footpaths is something that's being studied um, and the best way forward to have both, it's not an either or, it's really a both, is... is but, but it is practically fixable. And the, sorry, one more sorry, is around the um, City Mobility Group and the 44 trees. Do you know why... Um, is that 
road one. Yeah, 44 trees there, and you've suggested that we don't list it, but I, I just saw something about needing to trim for a little bit of sight lines, and it seems like a significant number of trees, but are they, you don't think they're important enough? Or? No, so um, the panel assessed that those trees is not meeting the criteria before the um, feedback from the city mobility area came in. So those, it, we looked at those trees and didn't think that they met the criteria. Okay. Where did that nomination come from? Was that a, from the community? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lord Mayor. I've got Alderman Zirko and then Councillor Kelly and then the Deputy and then Councillor Dutta. Yeah. Alderman Zirko. Yes. Pardon me? Yes. Good evening. Uh, look, uh, I just want to just speak in regards to the Federal Street trade. Like, <laughs> I think it's the main yeah, um, council officer, uh, our infrastructure person, has very much uh, made, made some very good points there in regards to those trees. Um, I don't know how, how many elected members have been down, down, down that area, but um, I have. Um, and plus there are cracks uh, already appearing on the grey property, I don't know who owns the grey property there. Um, I, I ask this, I, 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 I'd like to move that they, the trees in Federal Street are removed from the register or they are deferred for further analysis and uh, in particular uh, that potential damage to um, to um, private property. Because uh, there was a situation that occurred in, in Sandy Bay uh, where uh, there was a significant tree that council uh, had decided uh, to retain it. And uh, the uh, property owner actually uh, won the battle legally with it. So, you know, we need to, we need to give consideration to to do this in particular where um, one of our council officers has uh, given us uh, a very clear indication that, that um, it, it totally gets uh, these trees being um, nominated. So it's either going to be I, I move a, a, an amendment to remove remove the register, or I move an amendment that these the, 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 the uh, tree register for Federal Street be deferred. So uh, I, I seek advice from the from the um, director on which way um, to go on this. No one's actually moved a motion yet, so I suppose you could move the motion with the exception of those trees, but I can hand over to the director if he wants to make comment. Mm. Well, whatever, whatever motion is moved, I'll, I'll actually uh, foreshadow that uh, the trees in Federal Street be removed from the register. If that fails, I'll, um, I'll move it um, the alternative. So whoever moves the motion, I'm not prepared to move the motion, I've got other trees there that I'm not really happy with, but I'll speak in a moment. Well, look, it, look in relation to um, the potential damage of the adjacent buildings, I understand we have had independent uh, engineering advice on that issue, and that has been disseminated with Council previously, that um, the trees are not contributing to any damage uh, to that build, those adjacent buildings. So that's the advice that we've received in relation to that matter. If it's helpful, I can move the item. Um, oh, look, we've, just, we've got a few people that have okay. already put yeah, their yeah. so I might just sure. stick to that, otherwise it will be anarchy. Um, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. Through you to Ruby Wilson. Ruby, um, you mentioned how um, you're trying to fix those problems up and that. Um, is there a go-to tree now that if one was ripped out and another one put in that would not cause these problems in the future, or whichever way we turn here, we're not going to win. This is a matter of finally deciding if a tree had to go somewhere. In, the, in other words, uh, it's going to be a problem. We're not going to plant a tree. Does it get, get to that now? Um, there, we take a right tree, right place approach to 
tree planting. So it, there's not a single tree that we would say is going to be perfect for every situation. And equally, we it's in our the street tree strategy that says we really require a diversity of trees um, throughout the city to make sure that as, clim as the climate changes, as we get greater stresses and potential influxes of pests and disease, that we've got a robust and resilient urban forest. Um, in saying that, I. I don't believe the question here today is whether these trees get removed or not, it's whether they get put on the register. Um, if, if trees were to be, if we were looking at replanting trees in Federal Street, um, we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't plant plane trees. Um, and typically we don't plant plane trees because species that's very common in urban areas across um, Australia. I think the city of Melbourne has 70% plane trees in their CBD. Um, and that's certainly not something that we want to, to have um, that high proportion. So if we just hone in on Federal Street, if, if those trees were deemed to be too destructive and need to be pulled out, would there be a suitable tree for Federal Street, it was short of not doing study on that? Oh, there'd be many suitable trees. There would trees. be, okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not to say that um, those trees aren't suitable or that infrastructure modifications can't be made around them to make sure that the footpath remains safe and trafficable and retaining the uh, The reason I said is I could be influenced with my decision thinking, well, that should or shouldn't be on the register by virtue of it. Look, and we quite often hear this, a uh, certain trees being re removed and replaced with a more suitable tree. That, that's, I read that a lot. Yes. Oh, well, in terms of plane trees, we have, I guess, two of our most iconic avenues that are on the significant tree register are plane trees. So um, Salamanca and Fitzroy Place are um, established and, and iconic Hobart landscapes that are, that are the London plane trees. Um, thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor's next. Thank you. Through you, um, just in relation to some of these UTAS listings and what Ms um, um, Slattery <coughs> is um, suggesting uh, in relation to that sort of uh, heritage value, um, how, how much, you know, like the connection with former lecturers or whatever to commemorate yeah, as a commemorative tree, what sort of um, um, uh, value do you put on that? You, Mr. Booth. you, Chair. So specifically with regards to that one, it was acknowledged that the um, the professor in, in question had a leading role within the university and was well respected within the university. But generally speaking, we would tend to say that it has to ha a, a person would have to have a, a wider recognition within a greater community. So it's it's. It's, it's fantastic that the tree is planted on Utah's land and, uh, uh, and a memorial plaque is placed on it, but it wasn't felt that he was a significantly high enough figure within the wider community that he would, uh, that, that would uh, comply with some of the categories. We, we do have a relatively high threshold when it comes to that. And just in relation, the one for you, Ms Wilson, um, just in relation to that sort of landscape uh, of trees, you know, so U the UTAS campus has the, the gully of trees and so forth, uh, how is that considered, um, like is there a, a sort of landscape uh, value um, considered with these heritage lists or this significant tree nomination? Or any particular one you mean, or just in general? Well, you know, like uh, we've had this discussion around Mount Nelson and the value of the, the trees overall for the for the suburb. Um, so I just wondered if, if that that kind of thing is considered, and and I'm thinking also of the UTAS site. Yeah. Uh, so the the criteria that we assess, um, one of them is trees that have. Uh, local significance, so that might be considered as part of that. Um, and or, I think there's another one. Trees that are recognised as a significant component of a natural landscape, historic site, town, park or garden. So if you're, if you're thinking about the habitat values of a tree or sort of the broad environmental values of a tree, that's probably best considered under a different um, 
planning scheme protection. So something like, um, Neil, I might defer to you on this one. Well, I might defer to, to Sandra. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Ms. I, I could have a go at it, but um, it, no, Sandra will do a much better job, I'm sure. Uh, there, there are other mechanisms like, and a lot of uh, that area, for instance, um, that you're talking about above Churchill Avenue, um, in the planning scheme amendment that was withdrawn, a lot of that area was, say, being nominated for an environmental management zone. So that might be one way to protect it. But there's also a scenic protection code in the Tasmanian planning scheme. So that's another way to protect it. And I, I'll just say I did do a check um, for that question of whether any are listed above. Churchill Avenue and there aren't any. <coughs> There's only two trees on the site now on at um, two Churchill Avenue that are listed and there are um, two eucalyptus globulus and a eucalyptus pulchella and they're in, in the main campus. So nothing is listed yet, but there are those other mechanisms, environmental management or a, some sort of um, landscape area. And just to, just a final question, it goes to a conversation that I had with the Lord Mayor earlier, just um, in relation to the consideration of, of how how you go through this process. So part part four or five of the of the motion is to suggest that we go to you know five years. Is there is there do you, do you know of an easier way of doing this rather than you know because it is. Uh, as the report suggests, very time consuming. Uh, yeah, um, and it did come from our area, but the strategic planning team and, and looking at our resourcing and priorities because um, it has taken a while to get here to, to convene the, the panel. Um, and there are issues like it, you have to take the nominations, the panel needs to convene and see trees in, say, autumn. Um, different seasons, that sort of thing, and uh, it that it does get back in priority. Say when you've got structure plans and that sort of thing running at the same time. Um, as far as being easier, I think this is a fairly robust process, and I know um, just when they looked at the Tasmanian planning scheme, for instance, and looked at um, the listings there, there was talk about having uh, a more statewide approach to it and potentially using that there's some more, um, so each council now has its own criteria, but l using a, a more um, standard approach across the state um, and some better guidance on how to do it. So I think there could be some improvements in the process essentially. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a very simple question because the comment was made uh, that with regards to methodology, it is very subjective. There isn't the objective methodology to assess this. Would, would you want to comment on that, please? Um, and that, that's sort of what I was referring to through you, Chair, that um, in, um, I have actually had a look at some of the, the guidelines from other places and they do have a lot more um, information about at what the thresholds are for each of the criteria. And so, yeah, it would be an improvement. I guess if it doesn't happen at the state level, it is possible to even have a look at it here at council. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy to move the motion. Um, but I'd like to... Um, propose with the two additional nominations from the UTAS representative group number 20 and number 37. Um, and I'd also like, just to, in relation to that last question, just um, to add um, in the motion something like um, that a report be provided on the status of the urban canopy on public and private land um, to help inform us whether we've got the right tree protection uh, approach. Because I think, you know, we've got this tree canopy um, goal and yet this is our only method of, oh, we've got a, and we've got a lot of trees we're planting, but this is our only mechanism for the 
protection of canopy and I just, I mean maybe everything's going swimmingly and you know it's all good but I think it, before we make any further decisions if we could have a just an update about the extent of canopy on public and private land that would be helpful for future discussions. So yeah that would be the motion as read um, with those two additional nominations number 20 number 37 um, and that a report be prepared on the status of the urban canopy on public and private land. Thank you Lord Mayor. We've got Councillor Harvey next and then... Uh, yeah look firstly just for um, Councillor Kelly's benefit there was a, a report that came to the city through you chair through the city infrastructure last term talking about the, the federal street plane trees but it also looked at the options for what that road could be because it's such a wide road how do you fit in a bike lane how do you fit in a you know parking through lanes bike lane trees so there was a lot of effort that went into that we didn't get anywhere with it though we, uh, as I recall did we yeah look I think what uh, was agreed that that would uh, that the future uh, arrangement in Federal Street would be picked up as part of the North Hobart structure plan um, and so th th we would be looking at it at that stage. So, yeah. at, yeah, so hopefully we end up with a really good result for Federal Street that accommodates <coughs> all sorts of things and it might be those trees need to get moved in order to put in a bike lane or something on that side or better pedestrian way. Um, yeah I just want to say thanks to the team that did all this work Ruby and Co huge amount of effort that goes into it. But just think of the upside, though, we don't have to do this once. We don't have to do it again next week in a council meeting. So <laughs> we just get one shot at it. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to support the recommendations. Happy to add another couple of trees from the UTAS, uh, uh, on the UTAS side. I don't think there's any problem with that. But also just looking into the future, when people do have issues with the tree that's on the register, uh, what's the process? It's a planning application in order to do something to that tree, but it doesn't necessarily protect the tree forever. There could be a planning application to prune, to remove, to replace. Is that the correct process? Yeah, uh, look, that's correct. The, and, you know, it would be a uh, need to be assessed, obviously, uh, under, the, um, under the provisions uh, um, contained within the scheme. Um, and it may or may not, uh, council may or may not uh, agree for it, it, uh, its removal. Mm -hmm. There might be compelling uh, reasons for it to be removed. So. And can I ask a question about how many trees we have on the register already through you, Chair, to the relevant person? Probably Ruby, I guess. How many trees do we have on our significant tree register? <laughs> 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 uh, I believe it's over... Uh, is it, is it close to 300? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is some. Sandra's looking. And, uh, uh, while you're looking. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll have a look. Yeah. But also, I guess creating an urban tree canopy is also about not cutting them down, making sure we protect the existing trees as well as augmenting it with trees and appropriate trees in the appropriate locations over time forever um, and I guess that's the point for me that it's really important that we maintain the ca existing urban canopy on both private land and public land and we continue this mission that you have you know been tasked with to increase the urban canopy to 40 percent because we all get it that this is essential for the health of a city into the future what what I'm, I'm not attached to a lot of these trees I think they're weeds but anyway, um, going forward, you know, having the right tree in the right location uh, that doesn't impact the infrastructure, that also helps us to, um, that, that doesn't interfere with adding mobility options into the future. And it might be that if we didn't have so many cars, we could probably have a lot more places for, for trees, you know, all, the, all those cars taking up all that space throughout the city that could be um, additional tree planting spaces or native gardens or patches of whatever vegetation we choose but I'll support the recommendation tonight including the additional couple of trees at the uni. Councillor I've got Councillor Elliott, Alderman Zuko, Councillor Sherlock and then the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. So... Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I fully appreciate the value of uh, building our tree canopy and each individual tree from its own perspective of sustainability and climate change and also aesthetics and I can appreciate why a lot of these have been added to, nominated for addition to the register. Um, one thing that does trouble me quite a lot is that uh, when a tree is nominated and the owner um, isn't supportive of that nomination uh, because the reality is that going on to the significant tree register does place a burden on the owner um, and not only a, a burden from a financial perspective, which is quite significant given $770 for a lot of people and trees might have to be significantly pruned more than once. So that is an ongoing burden for, and it carries through each of the different owners of the property. Um, and then you've also got the, the process burden of uh, applying for a permit and the risk of that not actually being approved. So, but my, that, uh, those factors are quite uh, narrowed for me to being around uh, residential properties where the owner of that property hasn't consented. I have uh, no concerns from that perspective uh, when it comes to uh, commercial properties, larger scale properties, um, uh, government owned, government entities, that sort of thing. This is really about the, the, the small people where I have a concern with that. Um, there, this is a, a policy I'd like to look at in the future. I think perhaps it could be that, I mean, the objective is that we protect trees that need protecting, uh, but I would like to see, for example, the fee heavily reduced so that we're still getting the benefits of an assessment without the financial burden on an owner. Uh, so, I agree with what the Lord Mayor said in terms of adding um, the two more trees from the UTAS site. Uh, and I also share the concerns that Alderman Zuka has around Federal Street. But I would like to see, I'm not sure the process way to go about it, but um, I would support the, uh, the trees listed, excluding those which are on privately owned property where the owner of that property has opposed the listing. So, uh, so is that like a, a separate motion or amendment or could you as a chair? It'd be foreshadowed because it'd be a yeah, substantially different motion. A foreshadowed motion that uh, the where the property owner has uh, expressed has uh, not provided their support or has said that they um, oppose the listing uh, in when it's a private residential property, that their wishes are essentially honoured and that they are not added to the tree register. Uh, thank you. Next we've got uh, Alderman Zuko. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, no, I, I actually support the um, statements about privately owned trees on private property where the, I'm oh, sorry, I've got to get my video going, sorry. There you go, sorry for that. Um, I, I fully support um, uh, where private, uh, private uh, trees that are going to be listed on privately owned property uh, and the owners of that private property have objected to it. I don't believe that we should be imposing those type of restrictions and costs associated with that on private, on private landowners unless uh, the council or is there some way of uh, providing compensation to these people. So I'll, I'll support that part of the amendment. I, I, I don't necessarily believe it, it, is, it is actually contrary to the motion moved by the, the Lord Mayor because it can be moved as an amendment. And that's why I'm going to move an amendment to the trees in Federal Street. Uh, the uh, removed from the motion and that a further report be provided to council uh, in, in particular on what Mr Lang has stated and, uh, and uh, the report uh, look at um, uh, providing further uh, consultation with the uh, property owners immediately adjacent to, to those trees to ensure that we're not uh, potentially facing any illegal uh, um, challenges uh, based on the 
information I've been provided and, and my investigation of that of those uh, properties I've actually got um, um, photos that, um, that, 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 that demonstrate there are cracks in the, in the bottom of the building. So um, for the sake of getting a further report on those trees uh, that could save us uh, potential litigation in the future, um, you know, it comes back that, um, that um, you know, that, you know, there is definitely no, 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 no damage. I've got evidence to prove there is, you know, photos that prove to me there is. Um, we can all, always listen uh, at a future date. But let's, let's make sure that, um, as we say, I'm sorry. So I move, move for a further report on those trees in Federal Street. I've got an amendment there for, for the removal of the, the trees on Federal Street as well as a report. Just take an amendment if I can. Yeah, I've got, so... <clears throat> just whenever, that's just, yeah. whenever you're doing the amendment. Yeah, uh, I'll speak on that one as well. So, we've got uh, Kessler Sherlock. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, look, I fully understand what's um, being proffered in terms of, hey, we need to take account of, um, you know, owners of the property and on which the tree sits. I'm that somewhat though then conflicts with what's been said by the individual who came from Weld Street. And then we have 20 Adelaide Street. He's clearly not the owner of the two that are causing some kerfuffle to my understanding. Um, but the individual who does, who's the, the, um, the two trees are on, Adelaide Street I think it was, doesn't seem to have an issue with it. So it's, I don't know, it's like, okay, well, which, which perspective do we go with? And I think it's really difficult, as this circumstance sh shows us, really. Um, Weld Street owners of the, the property, even though it's not on their property, say, look, the trees are causing um, some issues. The individual upon which the trees actually reside, their property, they're like, I want it. Um, our arborist says we should list it. Um, so, and I know that the individual who owns the property on Adelaide Street has not objected to it, but somebody else has. So now which, which perspective do we consider um, as paramount? Uh, and it becomes, yeah, a difficult situation, I think, for me, and I, I'm a little bit conflicted by that. That's point number one. Point number two, um, I also support um, the Lord Mayor adding those um, two number... 20 and number 37, I completely agree with that. Um, with reference to the amendment that's been put forward by um, Alderman Zuko, yeah, I'm not really swayed by that argument. Um, I'm sort of leaning towards our arborist um, and their qualified advice around it. Maybe the cracks are in um, the building. Maybe somebody didn't build it properly. It'd be really nice to see those specific um, photographs um, because which, what is the problem? Is it the tree or was it the building, the construction uh, of the building itself? I, I'm not really sure. Um, so yeah, I'm not really swayed by that argument. Um, the Forest Road one, I wasn't entirely convinced by that one either. To, rem to uh, And I understand Mr Lang was um, just talk not actually, both actually, like he um, stated, he's not actually asking for the removal um, of the ones from Forest Road or from Federal Street, he just doesn't want it to consider us to consider it not being on the list, and I'm not wasn't really swayed either way. Um, and I think that's probably about it. So I'm a little bit, generally speaking, I'm a little bit conflicted about the Weld Street one, and I'm not really sure what to do with the two that have already that the um, individual came and spoke to us, who was the neighbour, um, with the the. You know, I, I, I don't know how we can actually help them out in some way because I, I feel terrible about the situation and it just feels like if we put one on the list and then it's... Yeah, so I'm a little bit conflicted by that. I understand it from the property owner's point of view. I also understand it from his point of view as well. Um, and then the six Cromwell Street, is it? Mm. Um, yeah, I think that was an interesting one too and we haven't really discussed that just with the, the fact that... Um, the, the child um, has an anaphylaxis potentially, so uh, whether we remove that off the list as well, I think that might be something to consider. Thank you. Next we have the Deputy Lord Mayor and then Councillor Loberger. Uh, 
Yes, um, look, I, I think it's um, this report suggests how interested people are in um, protecting and, and thinking to nominate trees. So, you know, 43 different nominators is, is very impressive. And uh, we know that um, it's, <coughs> it's, a, it's a really important component of, of what makes Hobart special. So um, making sure that we protect trees into the future is, is um, very important. So really pleased to have so much interest um, I'd also like to um, uh, commend the, the, the officers' work and, and detailed analysis of each, each of the applications. I'll be supporting the, the Lord Mayor's position and I just wondered um, if I might, through you, just ask the Lord Mayor, just in relation to part four with uh, that public process every five years rather than every three years, did you want to um, keep that as, as that motion? Um, a part of the motion, or, the, or you, you're doing a, re, a review about about that because that uh, would change it to every five years if we didn't. Yeah, personally, I feel it's too soon to go move to every five years, only because we've only done two rounds, and I think we've got a lot of catching up to do. So we didn't have any significant tree register for a long time, I think, or ever. Well, we had a limited one, and then we did a first round in 2018 and then there's this round and I sort of think maybe we should keep it at three years for one more round and see what else we get and then maybe go to five years so because we just I think we've got quite a lot of catching up to do and people are only just so I personally unless there's a really strong objection prefer to do it again in three years. <laughs> Back to at the yeah, well. I, I mean, it's fair to say that we have a, a, a significant a, a workload ahead of us uh, on um, planning scheme preparation uh, and amendments uh, ahead of it. We've got a number of structure plans that will uh, need a, a um, uh, scheme amendments uh, flowing from them. We've also, um, and it doesn't stop if there are significant trees, it doesn't stop someone nominating them, um, um, notwithstanding uh, that. If so that'll all stay on the website? The that's right. OK. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. So uh, if there was a significant <coughs> tree on, on, on council land or if it was on private land uh, that they own, they could nominate that. Um, so there's, there's opportunities there still. And I too support the, the UTAS uh, nominations to be part of this, this motion. I think it's, um, yeah, I think some of these things are, are important, but it takes a little while to, <laughs> to realise that, and I understand the, the explanation <coughs> as well. Okay, thank you, Deputy. Um, I've, got, I've got a good, still a bit of a list to work through. Um, Councillor Lowberger and then the Lord Mayor. We, yeah, I've got you. Um, right, I just wanted to say that uh, yeah, I will be supporting the Lord Mayor's uh, motion, um, but I do have significant concerns about the Weld Street trees. Um, one of them is a shared ownership tree, and I'm not sure whether it's possible to pull that one out and just list the two that are fully on the property of the person who wants them listed, and not list the third one, which is ownership. There was a bit of a dispute even about how much of it's on whose side. It's clearly a shared ownership situation and I'm uncomfortable in listing that particular tree but otherwise I would support the Lord Mayor's motion so I'm not sure how we'll go about doing that. It's a little bit complicated I feel. Lord Mayor can accept it or did it go through the amendment process? It is 85% owned by another party though. But the, the person who was objecting was saying it's 85% on their side. Um, and the other owner objected to that, I think. I think he said no, the I second said and third tree. I think he said the second and third tree he didn't want listed because, yeah, it was 85 and 15 was the third one. Yeah, it was the third one. And if you look at the canopies, it is it is very much on his side, um, canopy-wise. But particular. he's not being... He can, he can manage the tree is what the advice was. It's not impacting him prune it um, for its health. The management, yes. Yeah. I think he would like to prune it a bit sorry, more than that. We keep the things going through the chair so it just doesn't turn into, sorry, a, into sorry, a chair. conversation. Um, that's just my feeling. I, mm. I do feel uncomfortable in listing that particular tree. Um, so I would seek to have an amendment just to remove that one from that set of three. The two of them I'm fine with that are on the Adelaide Street property, but not the third one. Am 
might just seek the advice of our expert staff on that. Um, and also just whether the, because there is another piece of state legislation called the um, Neighbourhood Neighbouring Trees Nuisance Act, which in this particular situation, I think this applicant could say this is creating a nuisance for me and there's a whole suite of, it could actually be chopped down through that um, process, couldn't it? Oh, no, that's not, was it, oh, sorry, are we no, getting it wrong? Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the Neighbourhood Disputes About Plants Act. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that is an act that um, was put in place, I think, about four or five years ago. And it's the it's a way to get um, mediation between trees that are providing a conflict between neighbours. Um, so an outcome of that could be that a tree gets removed. But in making that decision, I understand that they would take into consideration factors of heritage, um, whether it's a significant tree, whether there's any planning or regulation around it. And would it override our significant tree register? I, um, I think you would need to, to go through that process as well if it was listed, yep. With a bit of clarity, if that's okay, could a landowner um, trigger that act if the tree is partially on their land? It's not really a neighbour's, the ownership shared then. Um, I, I think through you, Chair, the, the answer is we're not legal experts yeah. here, um, and um, I certainly am not wholly familiar with that act. Because not, not to jump in, I suppose it, it'd be safe to say that the interactions between this register and that the act wouldn't have been tested as yet. <coughs> Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. But I, said, I, suppose, I suppose it'd be safe to, to say that the interactions at the significant tree, tree register that council has, the way it interacts with that piece of legislation hasn't been tested in any way as yet, has it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So just on the idea of removing the one, would that be easy enough to do? Do you have any views about the removal of the one? From the register and just including. Uh, as in listing the two and not the one. So just third. listing the two, yeah. not the one. That, that would be an option that would be open to you, yeah. Uh, Councillor Harvey. I'll make some more remarks on my own. Yeah. We'll Look, way down my, the list. I'm just going to confine my comment to Federal Street, and as we heard from the director, there's a structure plan in the pipeline for North Hobart. And Federal Street upgrade will be part of that, or potentially could be part of the scope of that structure plan. And if these trees are successfully nominated tonight, it doesn't mean they couldn't be removed as part of a major upgrade of Federal Street in the future, true or not? Yeah, uh, look, certainly that's correct, but clearly we need to um, apply, and I think uh, Mr. Mr Lang expressed that risk that we would then need to go through a planning uh, process uh, before that was um, uh, permitted to occur. And that, that's a normal planning, 42 days? That, that's correct. Application yep. fee to ourselves? Yep. 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 Okay. But I don't think that's too yeah. onerous in the big scheme of things because to put together a structure plan would probably take how long? Uh, you know? Yeah, quite, yep. quite a significant. Yeah. And if we do decide to upgrade Federal Street, and I think it does need an upgrade, could end up with a great result without the, and those trees might go, you know, as part of that, which I probably anticipate anyway. So happy to continue with the nomination and worry about later when we do the structure plan. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Look, I'll make some remarks on my own. I've whacked myself in on this list. This is getting longer and longer. Um, just to start from the top, I, I broadly supportive of the Lord Mayor's motion. Um, agree with the report as well. Um, in regards to six Commonwealth strolls, so just broadly speaking, I think it's really important to note, as we've had a bit of confusion or, or, or discussion around um, Adelaide Street and Weld Street, you know, we've got two items on here that have uh, deputa had a deputation in against by a, by a property owner, or and then in favour of by the next door neighbour, and um, you know, one person talks and you see the other shaking their head in the background. I think. Um, and we, we see this not just with, with with this item, but with other items where 
we 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 need to be very careful about not getting involved in neighbourly issues and domestic like that's not. Um, uh, I think it's really important that we don't sort of accidentally find ourselves embroiled in any of any of this. Um, I've got concerns about Six Cromwell Street um, as well. I think that was probably, to me, the most compelling um, case or the most compelling argument for a tree not to be listed. Um, if we're talking about the issue of ownership, this one sits squarely on the property owner's property. And when you're talking about a tree that has been noted could present a clear and present health risk to someone that resides at that property, I think that's a that's a, a fair argument to say that perhaps, and as has been suggested, we're not, I don't think it, all of these items, we're not arguing in favour of removing the trees. We're just discussing whether or not it should be placed on this list that would make that more difficult. Um, so that's, that's one point. I'm not going to move anything from the chair, but I might just make my views clear on that, that I'd be supportive of taking that tree off the list. Um, Similar in regards to Well Street, I'd probably support the suggestion that we remove that one tree that's that's of, of issue. Um, in regards to Federal Street, it's an interesting one because it's not often that we have council making a deputation against itself, um, which I thought was curious. But I, I would think that if... Council broadly agreed that these trees were important for the streetscape and for the urban canopy, that that would get taken into consideration across the organisation. Um, and my worry is that if we, are <clears throat> if we register these trees, we're only hamstringing ourselves in that regard. Because if, if we do get reach a pos position where, as Alderman Zuko said, um, or as um, Mr. Lang said as well, that there's damage to the roads, damage to the road infrastructure or footpaths or adjoining properties, um, and council has to remove that. Council's hamstrung itself in that process. And whilst yes, it might just it's a, it's a matter of a, a development application, um, we're effectively adding a charge to ourselves to do something that we might we might ourselves want to do, which seems a bit counterintuitive to me. And I, I'd consider the same across the board all the way up to Forest Road as well. That that you know the, these are properties that present a present a potential risk to damaging council infrastructure. Um, why would we want to take away the flexibility of ourselves to do something about it? Uh, I don't think we're talking about a third party or a member of the pub, member of the public that um, you know might do might take want to get rid of trees for personal gain or for for for, for personal reasons. You know th these trees are council's own infrastructure, council's own assets, and they are assets, but. If we do find ourselves needing to get rid of them, we, why would we want to hamstring ourselves in that process? Um, so I'd support the removal of those suggested trees from the list, including Cromwell Street and Weld Street. And it, it probably is a conversation for another day, um, or maybe not what Councillor Elliott suggested about the, um, the fee structure. Um, if we're suggesting that you know, the, the, the conversation around removal or the conversation about um, um, removal, removing trees or pr significantly pruning trees that are on this register, um, it's a matter of you, you do a DA and you go through that process as some people might have to do. Um, are we doing that because we want to make sure that the tree is protected or are we doing that because we want to financially penalise the people that might find themselves wanting to do that? Um, I'm not saying we should make a policy decision tonight, but I think it's definitely something worth considering. Um, because we wouldn't want to be financially penalising people for finding themselves in a situation where they might have to trim trees and or, or remove trees that are on their property. So I'll I'll leave that there. Like I said, I'm not going to move anything from the chair, but I think particularly the Six Cromwell Street um, property, I, I'd be very supportive of removing that from the list purely like for no other reason other than a the property rights of the owner, but also the the health risks that it can, might present to people that reside there. Um, next up, sorry, we've still got a list to go through. I was giving. Um, is Councillor Kelly, then Councillor Dutta, then Councillor Sherlock. I'll be brief, thank you, Chair. Um, it just shows to me how complex this whole tree thing is. 30 years ago, it was hardly a tree in Hobart, around Lansdowne, Crescent, I suppose. In fact, North Hobart, 20 years ago, in the precinct planning there, you were not allowed to have trees. We as traders put forward 
uh, an idea to council, we'd like to see trees, and we got told bluntly, no, that can't happen because North Hobart has to remain a hard-edged precinct. And that, there's some merit in that, and I get that. We lobbied against that, and got trees in North Hobart, it looks fantastic. Um, right or wrong, don't know. Um, also to, um, uh, it just highlights too that we've got to really, in this new structure plan, give big prominence to this tree issue, you know, and I, I, we've got to obviously to, to devote more resources, I think, to council staff and to be able to address all those, these sort of things. We could talk here for hours and hours and hours about every one of these individual issues, but um, I'd just like to sort of highlight how important this is for us to consider as a council. You could almost have a portfolio just for trees um, and like that. Uh, so, um, I'm not saying we get to the ridiculous stage we put the council's uh, Cleary's Gates metal tree made for Salamanca on it. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help say that. Couldn't help but say that, sorry. Um, you know, and there's all these little nuances, and I won't drill down on the far, like, you know, landowner, and we've seen instances. I, pro pro in principle, agree with what Councillor uh, Elliot says about the right of the owner, but I've seen cases down Sandy Bay where people have bought uh, historic heritage areas and they've gone in and bulldozed them <laughs> because they're the owner. And for each one of these, the, I feel so sorry too for the Cromwell Street person. Um, there could be an argument, well look, that tree's been there for 50, 100 years, uh, buyer beware that if you're going into an area there, you've got to be there. I'm not saying that's the case in this instance, but I think that and the World Street one highlight the complexity of where we're going with this whole issue, and uh, I believe they should be put aside. Uh, I support um, uh, Lord Mayor's addition of the two Utahs trees. Uh, I support the Federal Street study by proposed by Zuko, Alderman Zuko, or Councillor Zuko, no, Alderman Zuko, I beg your pardon. It's going to get the whole ball rolling here, and it could be construed that, look, that can be left into the structure plan, but I think that's going to get things moving along here. And um, as I said, we've got to probably devote more resources to this whole topic later on. Bearing in mind, if the state government's going to do a statewide thing, let's be very careful, like we were talking about the other night. Let's not double up here, either. So um, they're just my comments in general. Thank you, Chair. So can I just ask a question just for clarification so that people don't... Um, uh, so we've got the information. My understanding is that we've, we, ha we considered a um, quite in-depth report about the Federal Street trees less than six months ago. Um, so we should circulate that to everyone because it's, it had arborist reports, it had an assessment. Like it was, how long ago was that? Uh, it was probably a year ago that we got a structural engineer to undertake an assessment with an arborist specifically on the property damage question. And that was quite a big piece of, like, we paid quite a lot for that. And so I, th I think it's too soon to do all of that again. Because we only, we only, it only came to council in this 2022, didn't it? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Chair. Just two uh, questions for clarification. Question number one, with regards to um, the uh, private land, what's the legal position with regards to that, and question two, through you to uh, uh, Alderman, Barak, uh, Alderman Zuko. Now, when he's suggesting the uh, federal street one, is it simply delaying it? Is, is that what he's suggesting? I just wanted clarification on those two. Thank you. Um, so, the, the, sorry, um, the question of le legality of us nominating uh, uh, trees. Trees on private land. Yeah, um, council has the right uh, to do that. They are the planning authority and they can um, nominate uh, those, uh, expand on the current nomination that already exists within the, within the scheme. And, and just a follow-up question, so that has been happening all along? That has been happening all along, for some time. Alderman Zuko, if you'd like to respond to the question. Well, as, I, as, I, as I explained, I'd like to uh, defer the Federal Street for a further report in regards to ensuring that there, there, that uh, we consult and particularly, I would say the best thing to do is consult the landowners if, if, in, in where they're at with this because my understanding is that they're, they're, they're going down the track of, of um, uh, with their, in a legal sense. Now, I've discussed this with the CEO previously and I, I don't 
remember if I discuss it also with the director. But um, there are, you know, there are photos that I, I, I distributed to the CEO uh, of, of, of damage that I saw there. I mean, look, we, it's not the be all and end all that we don't improve it tonight. Uh, it can come back, and I'm just the same. Let's, let's uh, defer it for a further report to come back. That's all. Um, you know, the council can, can, when that report comes back, it might not like the report and say, no, we're going to continue it. That's fine, fine enough. But at least, um, you know, we can appease ourselves that uh, we, we've gone down the legal path of making sure that we, we cover ourselves legally, and that's my concern. So all I'm asking for is, I'm not, I, I, I did state in my first, first um, discussion that I prefer to, to remove these trees from the register. I'm just uh, saying at the moment, let's defer for a further report on these um, on the federal street trees. Um, and that can come back, and all elected members can then decide whether they like it or not, or continue to have it on there. Um, you know, as has been stated, uh, you know, Mr. Lang is concerned about it, so we need to sort of, uh, you know, discuss it with Mr. You know, that report needs to come back with Mr. Lang's, you know, qualified advice. Um, and, and, and maybe uh, look at any other any other council department that might have concerns concerns about removing it. I understand it can come back as in a planning application, but that creates another issue for council. So let's make sure we get it right the first time. Yeah, I mean, look, um, clearly it's a matter for this committee, but we could defer it until the outcome of the precinct plan. Uh, because the structure plan. Because the structure plan will address this issue of those trees. You already have a report. We certainly already have a report and we have engaged with immediate property owners and in fact, we were waiting on some information from the property owner around um, leaves in gutters. So they were going to come back with us with further information. So we have had that report. We have had that engagement. But we also have had council make a determination that those trees, the future of those trees, will be considered as part of the, the structure plan. So it may well be premature until such time as the outcome of that structure plan is determined. Okay, um, um, sorry, can I just start? Uh, can I just uh, ask again, how much money have we only just spent within the last 12 months on the report on the Federal Street Trees? Because I just worry that you can keep saying, I want another report, I want another report, I want another report, until I get the answer I want. But, I mean, how much would have those reports cost? I believe it was Jeff Seria that engaged the structural engineers. I'm not sure of the cost of that. Um, and the you arborist? Or was uh, that the arborist and structural engineer work together. Um, so it, it is in they formed that, that report about potential damage to adjacent properties together and that was all paid for uh, not from my department so I don't have that cost in front of me. Do, do we have any idea, Director? Because I just... I just worry about us just picking out and having more reports on something we've just had a report on. Mm. I mean, it just we've got to be careful about how many... Uh, yeah, know. and look, I would agree, but Council has already made that decision in relation mm. to Federal Street that there will be a report coming as part of the structure plan, um, and that's, that's been agreed to by Council. So that they've deferred any decision around the removal of those trees um, pending the outcome of that structure. I'd just rather leave it, not complicate matters. It's Before we move on, has Councillor Dada, have you finished your remarks yet? Yeah, I, I was just asking the question for clarification. I would have liked to speak now. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Now, uh, ha having got those uh, clarifications and the points that have been made, uh, firstly, point number one, with regards to the private property, that has been clarified. So for me, there is, there is no issue because, uh, you know, it's in the legal... Uh, powers of the local government of the council to do that. So, that, so I'm satisfied with that. That answers the question. Number, number two, with regards to the federal street, I was uh, uh, in favour of deferring this uh, because from a legal point of view and the legal ramifications, 
Hence, I asked the question. And the fact that now I've been given the answer that the report has been made, and then we can include this in the structure plan, I'm satisfied with that. And point number three, with regards to the Weld Street, uh, again, like some of the others, I was in that particular situation as well. But if one is removed and the two are kept, I would be uh, quite happy to support that. So those are the three points that I made. Thank you. Uh, you, had, you did have your I'm hand up. To, uh, I'm happy to. I just want to say I'm happy, given um, the feeling around the room and if it makes it easier for everyone to support the whole motion, I'm happy to um, add in that we remove the one of the World Street. Uh, I'm not as... I'm not prepared to do the Cromwell Street because um, I'm not necessarily absolutely sure of all the all the information um, and I think it's been there for a very long time um, and it's, it feels as though it's a much more significant tree and it's also much loved by all of the, the neighbours and I didn't, I wasn't necessarily, I didn't feel I got enough information um, to think it was worthy of going against the officer's recommendation. But the one on World Street, I'm happy to, if that makes it easier for everyone. Um, Councillor Sherlock. Yeah, sorry, um, that was actually all the stuff I was going to say, <laughs> which was I'd like to do the World Street one. I did just want to clarify, though, because I thought in, in my notes I wrote down that... Um, the individual that was on Weld Street didn't want the second and third tree listed. Just as a matter of clarification, is that correct? I think, I think one though is on his got part on his land, and the other is that right? Sorry, the question is. You did the second and third tree to not be listed. It's my preference that none of them are listed. Right. So and I don't think we can do that okay. when the yeah, owner yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yep. So um, that number one for the Weld Street, I'd, I'd support that as well. Um, and then the six Cromwell Street one um, to not list that. And only because of the, like I said when I spoke, that the anaphylaxis of the child. Mm. So that was my concern. Um, and... Yeah, I'm really, really also grateful that the director has um, said two important things, really, that um, the structure of the report is um, going on right now, it's in hand, um, and number two, that we actually have a report already that is specifically about these trees. And so we're holding off on doing anything about these trees because there is a report in train. So thank you for confirming that. And... Um, yeah, I'm not really sure if that six rubble one is going to get up, but I'm, you know, I'm happy so to. So they are they amendments? Well, I have to take them separately because mm -hmm. I, you know, that confuses it completely for me. Well, <laughs> no, the amendment. No, the amendments is fine. Uh, I've I've yeah. accepted in the removal yeah. of the one from Weld, not yep. not any more than that. I haven't accepted in Cromwell Street because yeah. I don't. I'm not persuaded enough on that one. But that might be a separate thing for somebody. I don't know. I've got Alderman Zuko left, and then I'm hoping we can wrap up in the interest of time. I know this is an important issue, so I'm, I'm, I've kind of not resisted it going through the full motions, but we are getting quite Once late. We do have a few more yeah. items. Can we take items separately and vote on them? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah, we yeah. can. Like different exclusions and then the rest. If the, if the, yeah, the committee can choose to do that. Um, Alderman Zuko. Yeah, look, I've said, I need some clarification because I'm trying to hear sometimes not hearing very clearly the sound sometimes distorted. In regards to the comments made by the director, I need clarification. Did the director say that, that the structure plan coming from North Hobart will answer the problems of the Federal Street tree? Is that...? Yeah, look, um, council... Uh, uh, on the 11th of April resolved that the future management of trees in the streetscape, this is Federal Street, um, be considered as part of the North Hobart Precinct Plan project plan for this year. So, so yeah, so the, tree, the trees in Federal Street are going to be part of the structure plan, correct or incorrect? Uh, that's correct. So if, if the structure plan states that we remove the trees, then we're going to go through another process. That's the point I'm getting at. We need, we need, well, I can change my, my um, 
my, my colleague that our, my, my deferral to go down the track of, of, of saying that, that the trees in Federal Street be deferred until such time we get the report on the structure plan. That, that will, 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 will give us the time that we need to ensure that we don't have a, an issue coming. And I want, to, I want to make this point, maybe because we haven't heard from the other side as the director said, that's correct, you said you haven't heard from the other side for quite a while. Um, look, we, as, as I indicated, we had um, engaged with all property owners. I understand that one of the property owners was going to furnish us with some information and they haven't, they haven't done that to this point in time. And, and this is why I, I, I had my hand up. There's been a fam there was a family death, death uh, a couple of months ago uh, and I, I would say that's the reason why you haven't heard from them. So, um, you know, his, um, his uncle died and the whole family has been grieving. So that's, I'm only assuming that, right? But, but I'll, I would say that, um, that, you know, after, after tonight, uh, we'll, we'll probably most likely to have to hear from them. So if I could just amend it slightly, that, that the trees in, in Federal Street be deferred until such time we get the report on the structure plan and then make a decision on it. Uh, and Amendment with two parts. It's just that you, yeah, yeah. Is there any further discussion or are we happy to, to vote on the amendment and then the substantive? Put, put the vote. No, I, 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 Chair, um, the m amendment is there that brings in a different light to this. So I, I need to just seek clarification and, and talk to it. Because if what has been suggested as an amendment, um, I, I don't see the logic of it in the sense that the structure plan will supersede anyway. So if the structure plan is going to supersede that, there is no need for that. That, that's the way I'm uh, looking at this. Is, is that correct? Can the director provide some clarity on that? I'm not sure that's correct. Well, well so I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the actual question. Um, what you're saying is that if we, uh, the council proceeds to register, sorry, to list these trees, that subsequently uh, structure planning exercise identifies that they shouldn't be listed or removed, then um, then we'd have to go through uh, an application process um, to to have them removed. And, and so, what will that entail? Is it a very long, tedious process, or well, it's, a, it's, an applica it's a planning application like any okay, normal from the company. any okay. normal planning okay. application that would yeah. have to be advertised? And we would have to consider representations and if there are any appeals against that. All right, okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, let's, let's we'll move the amendment by Alderman Zuko. So that's the, the deferral, deferral of the Federal Street item of trees as as, 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 yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, as well as the inclusion or the removal of the Cromwell Street. So um, he's asked that they be voted on separately. So I'll move the, the first part, which is the deferral of the Federal Street trees until the structure plan is completed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. Aye. Show of hands, all those in favour? Alderman Zirko and Alderman Barakas. And against? The Lord Mayor, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Loberger, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Duffer. we have the other amendment, which is the removal of the 6 Cromwell Street tree. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. Aye. All those in favour? And against? The Lord Mayor, Councillor Loberger, Councillor Duffer, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Duffer. 
provide the uh, Council Kelly, Council Gata, Council Harvey, and the Deputy Lord Mayor. Right. Okay. And I had my amendment, but I know it's going to fail around the removing of old ones on private property where the owner opposes. Oh, we can across we can. the board, like the whole list. Yes. I think there's about 10, 10 items where the owner opposes, and that's all. I asked at the time around what the procedure was, whether it was a foreshadow. We can have it as an amendment. We can. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll move that. All those in favour say aye. 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 Can say no. No. Show of hands, all those in favour? Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my luck would change. Councillor <laughs> Alderman Zuko and Alderman Barakas. And those against? The Lord Mayor, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Lowberger, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, and the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. And then we have the substantive motion moved by the Lord Mayor. All those in favour say aye. 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 Can say no. Oh, I can see. Yep, yeah, there we go. Um, all those in favour. Lord Mayor, Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Eddie, Councillor Lowberger, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor, Orm Drakus. And, and against. Now. I'll, I'll take I'll take the some some the opinion of the committee because I know we've got a couple of other we've got a few people that are here for deputations and for items but we've been going on for quite a while so I don't know if people want a quick five minute break or or, or longer. I'm just a bit worried about quorum because I was going to go. Yeah, me too. Everyone else staying. I was going to go too. <laughs> no, you <laughs> weren't. You were here till ten. Just two other items. Just just. just Blast ahead oh, right. as right. much as I'd like to have a break. But yeah. Yeah. Can we yeah. Yeah, get rid of the deputations yeah. and maybe have yeah, a break? Yeah. Um, okay, then in that case, we have 5.1.2, 792 Sandy Bay Road, alterations and garage. We have a representation from Stephen Calladine. We'll just give a minute for the, the room to clear out a bit, but. <clears throat> Thanks everyone for staying late again tonight. See ya. I might just, sorry, I might just ask if can we have conversations outside so that we can continue the meeting. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Then you've got five minutes, and then we'll um, have some questions for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I bought the house my wife and I about 10, 12 years ago. And we went on an extensive search. We drove estate agents crazy because we couldn't find the house we wanted because the, the one thing we wanted was a house that had a private balcony, a deck, with a good view, of course, but that privacy. We finally found the place in Mitre Crescent and we saw that down to the left, there was some development going on. So we asked the agent what was happening with that development. And they said, there's a garage being proposed and it will just add value to that property. So we bought the house and substantive consultations with the Griggses that own that property confirmed that it was indeed a garage and everything was fine. Somewhere along the line, probably quite recently, that morphed into a, um, a roof terrace, not even a deck, but it was a, a complete 40, 45 square meter roof terrace. And that area where I live is an extremely tightly packed area. It, it has been subdivided. There's the lot that I was on that has been subdivided into units. It's been subdivided into my property as well. And it's extremely close to the house where this development is being proposed. Extremely close. There's just a narrow laneway. And as the... the, the um, the person at council, the officer, 
looking at this, said in the report that's in the agenda that the, the two properties are 6.9, the deck, roof terrace, is 6.9 metres away from our deck, as if that's a long way. That's the distance from here to that television. That's what, it, that's what that is. Our deck is about one metre beyond that. And their deck, like that television, is angled, will be angled. And our deck is already angled. So the two decks will be angled towards one another. And it's going to look straight in to our deck. And the, the nature of that area is that the houses downstream are all built up double storey. Downstream, we've got flat roofed houses, large houses, but flat roofed. So the natural position of people on that new deck will be to look down the river, which is directly towards where our deck is going to go. Um, the, the, the oh, what do you call them, the officer, the, the person who, who planning officer, mm. um, said that there's a buttress wall that already gives us protection. That buttress wall is that wide, literally that wide. I measured it this morning. It's about 85 centimetres wide. So it's giving no protection whatsoever, and it will look directly into us. I've, I looked on the agenda this morning and there are eight people have objected to this. And that's just about everybody that this affects in the whole area is against this. And I support those objections. I didn't, they've brought things up that I didn't realise. The council say that it's a, uh, officer say, says that it's a quiet area. I wish. That mitre lane where this comes down, it's, it's extremely steep and a lot of cars and delivery trucks and things come down there. And I'm constantly hearing a screech of brakes because they come down there at the rate of knots because they, it's a really steep road. And <coughs> delivery drivers in particular, although it's one way going up mitre lane, they use that to to go up there. They shouldn't, but they do. And they come round that bend, and that's where you get the screech of brakes, because there's something coming down there at a far too fast a speed, and there's a car trying coming around that. This will make it block it off completely. So it will add to, uh, add to all that, all those problems already in that area. That's why eight people in a yes. tight... You've got, only a, sorry, I, you've got 30 seconds left, so if you could, okay. if you could wrap up. Um, but it, it, it doesn't meet the overall objective of the planning scheme, which is to give reasonable privacy for dwellings. And it just doesn't do that. I gave a, a photo with the, my application, but fortunately I saw it wasn't in the agenda. I've got photos on here, but it's probably not appropriate to to show you these, but I can. But it will, it, it's six metres, six metres away from our, our deck. A little bit more if you add on the, the, the small little pathway. Um, it, yeah, look, that, that's, 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 that's time, I, I yeah. I don't think I can say anymore. We'll, we'll, I'll we'll, just beg you to yeah. Thank Not you. Are there, are, there any, are, there any are there any questions? A deputy. Through you, Chair. Thank, thank you very much. Um, this, uh, the, the deck that you're talking about, and I was just really looking at the, um, the, the carport or the garage, um, but it's 45 square metres, which sounds like a, quite a large... Yes, area. yes. It's, it's really a roof terrace. So do you, you think that there's going to be some um, noise impacts as well? in relation to this, potentially? Oh, well, there, there could well be, yes. But my main concern is privacy. It takes away all our privacy. And in relation to, um, like, a setback, 
Um, it's my understanding that this comes to the out to the, the boundary on two sides. Yeah. Is that right? No, so there's right. no there's absolutely no setback. Oh, there'll be no there's set. No setback there is no in, setback in that, in that part. Yeah. So I thought that that would make it that it would have to be a screened. It would have to have a a, a screen uh, with a, an opacity of not less than twenty five percent. But I believe that doesn't apply because it's not a uh, it's a front boundary. It's considered a front boundary. Why it's considered a front boundary, I do not know because it's it's side it's the side of the house that's onto the side of my house. But apparently, it yeah. it is. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We'll. Um you can take your seat again. We'll um, get on with the debate. Does anybody want to open or are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Dada. I, I, I move that uh, this uh, be refused under clause 672P1. Yes. That is, the design of vehicle access points must be safe, efficient, and convenient, having regard to all of the following that is, A to D, and it does not meet. Uh, in my view, uh, satisfies the provision uh, D, ease of accessibility and rec recognition for others, for users. Right, okay. Uh, I've got Councillor Lowberger, then the Deputy. Uh, I just had a question for the Director through you, yep. Chair. Um, approximately how much would it cost us to install a reflective mirror in the vicinity of this area so that the cars can actually see each other around the corner? Oh, look, um, I don't know the exact figure, but um, it would be in, you know, in the order of a thousand dollars, I suspect. Um, there are varying um, views around the effectiveness of such mirrors. Um, I understand our traffic engineers aren't necessarily a fan of those um, structures, so. A deputy. Yeah, look, I, um, I find that this, you know, like uh, we only have the discretions, I think, of, of parking, but I, I find this, um, the, the size of this, this decking and the positioning of this car, carport or garage, whatever it is, um, just on this corner seems to be um, a really poor planning uh, proposal uh, to be honest, and I just, just uh, I'm curious to to know from um, the director, just in relation to this setback, is it a legal setback um, as to the, the the current wall, particularly on Mitre Lane, which is the one going up to? Yes, uh, that that wall has been given planning consent and and associated building consent. Yep. But, but why on right on the boundary um, on, on a corner like this? I just can't understand the, the reasoning and logic of it. Yeah, look, I, w I wouldn't like to necessarily speculate why, why it was. Uh, but it, look, it's not uncommon to have walls on, on boundary frontages. In fact, there are uh, a number of uh, walls uh, on that laneway. So... Yeah, but they're not, not on a on a ninety degree corner. I, I, look, I, I acknowledge that, yeah. uh, but I I, I wouldn't spe I, I can't speculate on on the reasoning. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other comment, questions? I might just ask again. The issue with the front of the property. Um, so, which part of the property is the front? Is it the sort of the southerly boundary that we? we're assuming is the front? <coughs> well, it's, not. it's got two, effectively two frontages um, because it has a frontage to a road on both, both sides. So we're assuming that both of those frontages are the front in that case? Sorry. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that, that's right. And, and look, uh, in relation um, I think the Deputy Lord Mayor did acknowledge the discretions here. Uh, one of garage setback and front fence and design of vehicle access. Now, arguably, 
the proponent could propose a deck and have no discretions. Um, so I think the issue, uh, and privacy is not a discretion here. I understand what the, uh, what, what the representor has indicated, his concerns, but that is not a sustainable basis for refusal. And um, based on officer's advice, nor is the uh, vehicle access issue. Uh, last question. Um, do we have the right to um, ask for a screen to be placed? No, because again, that privacy is not a discretion. Um, there's no basis uh, to um, require that under the scheme. And if you did, an appeal would find that that condition is, wouldn't be lawful. Thank you. Councillor Dada. Yeah, just uh, seeking a clarification through you, Chair. Yep. So the, uh, um, the reason that I have uh, stated uh, that it's clause 672P1, is that a discretion? Th that it is. is. Thank, that, thank that, you that so much. That is a discretion. So that's fine. Thank you. And therefore, I didn't mention uh, uh, in, in my uh, reasons with regards to privacy because it wasn't a, a discretion. Mm -hmm. And as I want, just want to speak to that, I mean, this is a uh, uh, recommendation from staff to, uh, to approve it. Uh, there are eight who are objecting it. And as I always do when I make a contrary decision that is sum submitted, I base my argument on performance criteria or acceptable solution. And in this regard, uh, I'm basing it on 672P1, and uh, it clearly states that it must be safe, efficient, convenient, and I don't think it meets that or uh, uh, satisfies that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Yes, I'm, um, I think it's one of these quirky little ones that with these laneways and all that, it's just, just an awkward one that the planning scheme probably can't cope with. And um, in light of, uh, and I totally concur with uh, Councillor Dutta, the 672P1 should adequately uh, legitimise this. So I, um, I, uh, that's my stance on that. I, I, I will go against, I don't, not often I go against the council officer's recommendation, but uh, on this occasion I will be. Thank you. There's no other comment. I won't say too much other than on this case, I'll be supporting the council council staff um, recommendation, but I'll put the motion moved by Councillor Dutta for refusal um, to a vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can say no. 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 So show of hands, all those in favour. Councillor Sherlock, Councillor Lowberger, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Harvey, Deputy Lord Mayor. And those in favour? Oh, those against, sorry. Okay, so that is. Hey, so that's that one done. Um, we'll move now on to the last item with the deputation, or the second last item with the deputation, sorry. Um, item 5.1.3, 61 to 63 Hamden Road. We have a representor, Mr. Andrew Edwards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm representing the Battery Point Community Association in relation to this application. There are three elements I wish to address. Firstly, <coughs> the application was for partial change of use. The second, I believe the, the officer's decision to approve it flies in the face of current council policy. And the third relates to the car parking issue and the discretion that um, is mounted. Firstly, the application was for partial change of use to this site. The site is in a commercial mixed use zone. It has two mutually exclusive uses, one a four bedroom residence and second, the post office in Battery Point. So the partial change of use really refers to 100% change of use to the, resident, the four bedroom residence there. Uh, the association pointed this out in its uh, submission to the council However, the planning officer has not addressed this uh, point of uh, clarity at all. It referred, he referred only to the car parking issues that are raised by the other 10 represent, representors to this um, application. So firstly, it is not a partial change of use. It is 100% change of use. And no doubt some of you have read the executive summary and says the planning approval is sought for a partial change of use to, to visitor accommodation 
at that address, more specifically the proposal includes a change of use to allow part of the subject property to be used for visitor accommodation. We contend that's not correct. It is 100% change of use to a, a residence that is on the site adjoining a commercial use of the post office. So that is a point that uh, was not addressed by the planning officer and we just moved, moved on to other arguments in relation to uh, car parking. And I think that the, the terminology partial and allow part of the subject property is erroneous. I think it is, it is uh, I say in gentlemanly terms, it is uh, not correct. And I think it should be addressed as a 100% change of use. So we contend that the use term partial use is not correct. The second relates to the permitted use within the urban mixed use area. And on the, in the report at 6.6.3, he states the existing use is residential, single dwelling, and business and professional services post office, which is a mixed use zoning. The proposed use is visitor accommodation. The existing uses are permitted uses in the above zone. The proposed use is a permitted use in the, in the zone with the qualification that, and this is the council policy, any self-contained accommodation must not be located on the same site as a dwelling providing long-term residential accommodation except for caretaker's cottage. So that's the council's policy position. The planning officer goes on to say, the proposal is considered to comply with this qualification as the proposed visitor accommodation use would replace the existing long-term residential accommodation. Now, I find that a total conflict with the council's stated policy. I can't interpret, or the association can't interpret how, how that second statement by the planning officer can uh, uh, meet the requirements of the council's planning decision. So that's the fundamental that we, we've looked at. The, the third point we wish to raise is about the car parking. And it's, it's a big discussion in Battery Point, it's a big discussion in North Hobart, it's a big discussion in any city, any inner city residential area about this car parking issue. The council are fully aware that the association has had long extensive talks about traffic management, parking management in the Battery Point area. Uh, it is ongoing and the council officers have given the association representatives time to consider, to look at it and work with them. But this use of uh, visitor accommodation car parking is a real conflict in that area. Um, one of the main arguments under the uh, performance criteria is that, um, uh, and 6.75 in the report, it's table E, 6.1 in the uh, performance criteria on car parking, uh, uh, specifies that two on-site car parking spaces for a dwelling that has two or more bedrooms. Therefore, as the existing but dwelling on-site... 30, 30 seconds left, if you can wrap up. Okay, well, the, the, what, I'm really, what we're really saying is that there's the, the argument based on that this public transport within 400 metres of this house allows the discretion of no car parking to be allowed at all, which is totally contrary to any other use. Uh, I live next door personally to a three bedroom house that's a visitor accommodation. Not once has there been anyone that has arrived without transport. The scooters or hire cars are out there. And from the previous resident's point of view, the car parking is a real issue in that commercial zone. It, it, in, it spills over to Waterloo Crescent and all up and down Hampton Road. This visitor accommodation will take out of the market a four bedroom long term residential. So that's the associated yeah, that's, point of view. That's, that's time, thank you. Um, any questions from the floor? Councillor Lobecker. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask um, the representor here um, just about whether they have any, anything to, to report to us about noise and behavioural issues associated with visitor accommodation in Battery Point? No, we, we don't have any issue to, to do that. Um, my personal experience with well-run visitor accommodation is that the discipline is there. The occupants are regularly um, well behaved. The, the use of vehicles is a significant thing. And we, if we talk about riding bikes and Salamanca, etc., the visitors don't come to Hobart to walk down to Salamanca. 
if you look at the two most visited sites in Tasmania, it's Mona and Port Arthur. Therefore, there's vehicular traffic. And quite often with four bedrooms, there'll be probably half a dozen people. There'll be one people mover, which is a, a decent van, and that's you know, reflected. The statement about 400 metres to Metro is without basis of any empirical um, support. There's no measure, there's no survey. It's a nice soft option within the performance criteria for car parking. Other questions? Kelly and then Deputy Lord Mayor and then Councillor Dutta. Uh, it's uh, through, through you, Chair, to the Director. Is this contestable in the Tribunal? Uh, oh, look, look we'll, 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 do, we'll do questions of the applicant. Oh, yeah, first, sorry, and then we'll, yeah. Did you have any questions of the applicant? Uh, no. Um, no. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mr. Edwards, for, for <coughs> representing the um, the um, uh, Battery Point Association. Um, so just just again, just talk about that um, the the previous use and um, that that interpretation that you feel has been misrepresented in the report. Previous use was a privately occupied four bedroom house. Yep. Um, stand alone uh, next to an access different to the commercial use, and that commercial use is within the existing zone. It's now been bought by out, uh, people from interstate who have made this application for a visitor accommodation. And we believe that the, the officers hasn't really addressed the issue of partial change of use. It is 100% change of use to a four bedroom residence. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Dutta and then Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Um, just uh, one question that I have. Um, the uh, report stated that there was a private arrangement made by the previous owner for a car parking. Are you aware of that? No, uh, no, I'm not. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know where that was. I, I have spoken to the previous owner and they had uh, parking permits and I, I actually you know, saw some information about car parking there and, and the information was that it's spilling over uh, up into Waterloo Crescent, DeWitt Street and all other side streets as well. Thank you. Harvey. So, Mr Edwards, uh, to the best of your knowledge, the owner won't be living in the premises. I, I can't answer that question. Uh, he wouldn't be applying for a visitor accommodation if he was going to live there. So I, I would suggest that uh, the implication is that it's a, a interstate owner who is uh, applying for a visitor accommodation for that very purpose. I, I, but I can't answer the question categorically. But whole home short stay in Battery Point is banned, so it has to be partial well, uh, it's short not, stay. It's not partial. No, but I mean, in order, this is what it's applying for, partial short stay, the use of the house because it's over a certain... But no, if you read it, it, re it relates to the whole residential premises, the four bedrooms. Okay. Because that, that, cause that's, that's the question for the officers for me, if it's whole home. Anyway, we'll get to that, yeah. Any further questions of the representation, representor? No, thanks a lot for your time, if you want to take a seat. Now, before we kick off, I think I might give the um, director an opportunity to sort of comment on the, the nature of Battery Point and Shores Day. Yeah. yeah, look, happy to. I want to first point out that this is... Um, this proposal is located in a, in a uh, mixed-use zone. It is not in the residential zone mm -hmm. where short-stay whole house is prohibited. In fact, this is a permitted use within this location. Secondly, this property, 61 to 63, has two uses contained within the property. One is the post office and the other is a dwelling. Hence, we have to describe this uh, change of use as a partial change of use for that site because the post office remains as uh, that use. What they are seeking is a partial change of use of that site, so far as the dwelling is concerned, to a short-stay visitor accommodation, which is permitted. I would also like to point out that the only discretion with this application relates to car parking. Now, the current um, dwelling would, under normal circumstances, require two car parking spaces. 
the requirement for visitor accommodation is one car parking space. So what this application effectively is doing is reducing, under the scheme, the uh, demand for car parking for that site uh, in practice. So the officers have considered the application and are strongly recommending that, the, that uh, it fulfils the requirements of the scheme uh, so far as the um, proposal is concerned uh, against the provisions of the scheme. Okay, we've got Deputy and then Councillor Dutta and then Councillor Loberger. Uh, through you to the Director, just in relation to 6.3 and what Mr Edwards has, has raised uh, in relation to any sort of container accommodation that must not be located on the same site as a dwelling, providing long-term um, residential accommodation mm. except for a caretaker's dwelling. Mm. And um, <coughs> so we know that it's no longer going to be a, a residential property. Um, is, can that be um, regarded sequentially so that it's, um, it no longer is a residential property um, and it must be um, the self-contained accommodation cannot replace an existing, uh, yeah, existing we, we, residential yeah, purposes. Yeah, we don't read it um, as you described. Um, we, the interpretation of the officers' uh, reading of that clause is that if this is approved, then there won't be a dwelling on that site and therefore is is uh, satisfies that that um, criteria. That that's our interpretation. Appreciate that there might be alternative views, but that's not uh, our view. And the the parking um, that has been raised by I think all of the representatives uh, is obviously of concern. Apart from from uh, this change of use, is obviously a concern for for no matter that it is in a commercial area, um, what, what value does uh, the concern of residents have in, in this, um, this, this consideration tonight? I mean, look, I, I'm not denying the, the concerns of, of um, representatives. They have a right to, to make a represent, representation. What I am providing you is qualified advice as to the application against the provisions of the scheme. And I'm strongly suggesting to you that, I, um, that the application before you meets those requirements of the scheme. And to refuse it would be subjecting yourself to a, a very strong appeal against that refusal. And I'm fairly confident in saying that you would not sustain successful um, defence of that decision before the Appeal Tribunal. I can't be any more stronger than that in this case. Councillor Dutta. Uh, the, the question has been answered. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Loberger. <coughs> um, I just had a question for the Director through you, yep. Chair. I've got a number actually. Um, there's a condition being mooted in here to, to discourage guests from parking cars. Am I correct in saying that? Which condition? Yeah. <coughs> Point five. Oh, yeah. Page 758. Um, I'm just wondering, I've got a few questions about that, I guess. Um, <coughs> how is that policed? Uh, it, it can't be um, policed. Um, people have a right to park vehicles in a public car parking space on, on the street, subject to the time constraints and any other uh, limitations imposed by the local um, uh, road authority. So it is simply uh, a requesting that the um, owner to discourage 
that use, not to prohibit it. Uh, okay, if we are dissatisfied with that, that discouragement not being strong enough, is that a grounds for refusal? I, no, I wouldn't. Look, it, I mean, you've, the only discretion you have is in relation to car parking, and as I indicated to you before, the current um, requirement for that site, for that dwelling, is two car parking spaces, and the proposal that you would be, if approved, only requires one car parking space. It could be well and truly argued by the proponent that you, in fact, are reducing the car parking pressure on the surrounding streets with this a application if it went to appeal. So I, I just don't believe it's a sustainable argument before a uh, appeal tribunal. I guess my final question is why, why put something in like that if it's unpoliceable? Well, it's, it's to provide at least um, prior knowledge to um, uh, people that are booking it that there is no car parking and uh, as a consequence, and there are fairly um, significant restrictions within that uh, neighbourhood so far as residential parking and time limitation parking. So it's not unreasonable to make uh, potential visitors uh, and users of that facility aware of it, and I think that's appropriate. Thank you. Any other comment? I'm happy, look, I'll, I'll just because I know in, in the past we've had um, we've had short stay applications, and some of we've had a few that um, have been voted for, for refusal, and there's been a few that I've supported those um, votes for refusal because there's been a very compelling um, case behind them. But we've also had quite a few that have come before council and been refused. And as has been well ventilated in, in the public sphere, they get appealed. And it's not just that we lose the appeal, it's that we can't even find planning lawyers that are willing to take on these cases. And when I, when I, read, um, when I read the comment in the 6.7.11 7 um, that says from the council officers, representations make valid points on the current parking conditions of Hampton Road and the impact that this visitor accommodation will have on the road. However, the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme 2015 does not provide an avenue for refusal in this case due to, due to the existing demand of the site. And that's regarding the only discretion that we have in this case. I, I worry that this is going to be another one of those cases that if we do refuse it, in two months' time, it'll be back in back in front of us in the closed part of the council meeting. And we'll be told that we have to we have to approve it because we've got no case to answer in the appeals tribunal. And that, you know, I don't want to speak for any of the planning staff, but more often than not, the planning staff avoid you know giving their giving their well, entering into debate or not, or being overly strong in a recommendation because. Their, 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 their role is to, to recommend us, and rightfully so, but I think that's as strong as I've ever heard the director speak on an item. Um, and I think that says a lot on, on its own, and I, I say that not wanting to speak for him, but I'll, I'll just leave that said. I think it's, I know it's, this is a, the short issue with short stay is one that um, elicits quite a bit of passion in, in debate, but from the purely planning perspective of this item, it, 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 it clearly meets the, criteria that's in front of it. Um, further, in November, early November, I received an email from a um, person who turned out to be the applicant for this, who indicated to me that they they're a, have a professional job that requires them to spend half of their time in London. So this is a house that they would be wanting to live in um, when, they're, when they're not, when they're here, but they wanted to have it as a, as a use outside of that. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm just putting that there as relevance if, we, if we're talking about the removal of a house from, the, from rental or, we, or anything, like, anything like that. This, this isn't a house that contributes to that, it would be contributing to that. So I'll leave that there. I know that the deputy had her hand up for a second. I don't know if she wants to add anything or I'm happy to move it to a vote. For the vote. Deputy? I don't think we've got a motion, have we? Oh, nobody's moved it.
Fine. I'll move that we um, support the officer's recommendation. Okay. Um, I don't think there's an option. As much as I'd like to vote against it, there's no option. And I think you're right, it will come back and we will overturn it in a closed meeting because sadly we can't find people to defend any of these things. So, Councillor Dutta and the Deputy's pens both shut up. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I, I uh, uh, take into consideration the uh, recommendation by staff. I take into consideration the eight people who have uh, made submissions and uh, the uh, very strong presentation made. And I've heard the presentation, and I've tried to put that arguments under clause 661. And I have difficulty uh, to counter the recommendation of the staff. And so for this time around, I have no grounds uh, to say I refuse this. Was there anything further from you, Deputy? Um, I, just to, to the point that Mr Edwards so eloquently made, I think um, we, we won't be considering 35 Feltham tonight, I don't think, um, but I, I think his point is valid for, for that application, so I'll just make that point. Um, uh, but obviously, yeah, I, I, am, I, I can't support this tonight. Uh, I won't be supporting it, um, and I think there are, are grounds, but you know, uncontestable <coughs> or untested um, in the tribunal. Okay. Well, with that being said, we've got a motion moved by council. And so Alderman Zuko here, because he should have his camera on, I think, as a standard thing if you're on, on Zoom. There he is. There he is. Okay. Um, I'll make uh, it. Uh, I don't have to have my camera on. Uh, um, at all whatsoever. That was not uh, raised at uh, other meetings when people didn't have their cameras on. Thank you. Well, hmm. okay. it's, it's only raised because all of the go. No, no. It was standard no, no, council meetings. We won't, we won't even support. go into yeah. debate. It's uh, not worth I'll, move, I'll move. I'll move the item. Um, moved by Councillor Harvey for, re for the officer's recommendation. All those in favour say aye. Aye. I again say no. Aye. Okay. Uh, I'll show of hands. All those in favour. And against, raise your hand. Very good. So, great. So we've got one more item with a deputation. We're chugging through them event slowly. Um, we we've. Just a yeah, he's just here. So it's 45 Elizabeth Street. It's a motion for extension of time. We've got. Um, I'm with the recommendation. Yeah, I'm happy to. Oh, I, I want to ask a question oh, of Mr. Giannis. Mm. <laughs> no, it won't be long. Sorry. Oh, we won't have a. Have we got a call? <laughs> Uh, we don't we don't have a quorum but oh we do uh, alderman zirko alderman zirko so he has to put his camera on yeah yeah you have quorum yeah. this is maintaining quorum can you keep your camera on for the moment please thank you uh really has left the room temporarily so she'll be back. Uh, so, so just in relation to your application, um, and you know, like this is a fantastic application that we and it went to tribunal, so it it um, met my um, um, concerns about heritage. So I'm pleased about that. But uh, it's a, a very strange thing for a green to ask a developer of, of this. But what what? do you require of council i mean is there anything that can make this happen because it'd be so good for the heritage of our city for for this development to go you know to to get out of the ground to up, upgrade the beautiful old kodak kodak house and she's not committing us to anything <laughs> just asking you a question <laughs> five five car parks down there <laughs> It'll be built. It's just been a tricky one to, to put together. It's a really challenging site for access and logistics, and it just came at a time when there was a bit of a uh, we were sort of unsure whether it was the right time to build it. Yeah. The appetite was there. It was the aftermath of COVID, um, and yeah, we just sort of haven't 
been able to get to it and it's we've had other got other projects on as well so it's sort of we just need more time but yeah it, it, but the, the whole point is to get it done yep so the intention is a lot of is work in it in the in getting the building and engineering together for that and it took us quite a while from getting the DA to then trying to get the BA through so we've just run up at a time yep. thank you uh, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, look, I did see it on the market, so I was a bit shattered when I saw that. I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> yeah, we just had to sort of weigh it up because mm. we know we've got 90 Melville as well, which is quite a big one, and mm. 287 Liverpool. And as much as we like the project, it's quite a small one as well mm. in comparison, so we really wanted to just test it out and see where that might lead. We had some interest with when it was approved of um, some other developers and builders asking whether they'd be able to be in a joint venture or look at you know being involved or buying it and um, it's quite attractive because it's got the, the like the passive investment down below the the leasehold there so it's a few risks in a bit so yeah had a bit of interest so I guess we thought we'd just try it out there's been some talks nothing's really eventuated um, so it's still there in our office. We just haven't been able to get it together. We, even to get the people to do it, it's been tricky finding mm. the right people to do it. Mm. So I guess at, at the time of building, we'll, we'll probably be looking for some, you know, we'll be coordinating with council for permits and so forth because we'll need to do some, get some cranes set up and lift things up and it might need to be rotated at times and so mm. forth. Yep, okay, so you've still got it good. <laughs> Hope we can it, get yeah. there, yeah. Any other uh, comment or questions? Just wanted to make it worthwhile for you staying for four hours. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, thank you for your, thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Councillor Dutta. I, I move the recommendation. Yeah, very good. Oh, questions. Very good. Look, I, just in the interest of time, I think I was I was supportive of this at the time, so I think it's a great development. So, I'll I'll leave that there, and we can all um, I'll let you get on your get on your way. So we'll put that to a um, to a vote. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Against, say no. No, that's that's carried unanimously. Thanks for your patience tonight. It's been a been a long meeting. I know. Man, we've got a couple more items. Did we want to take a break, or did we want to just push through and finish it off? Well, we're, we're almost we're almost, we're almost yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll move the city planning advertising report. Do we still have, no, no, one sec. Maribel Esplanade. 5.4 has dropped off. Oh, I'll move that it be. We've determined it, so. So it's done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it may be a motion to yeah, I'll, remove I'll it. I'll move from that it's with, withdrawn. Uh, uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Oh, we might, I think. You, if you go, we don't have the We don't have quorum if you go. I could. Mine is Alderman Mazzucco's gone. We've, we've only we've got not much left, but we, we won't have. I we need won't. food. Oh, so shall we have a? Uh, Is something to eat or not? Yeah. We can take a. <laughs> can, so, should we take a ten-minute break? Let's take a ten-minute break. All right. Oh, can we vote? Can we vote on this last item? Yeah. yeah. Just now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just so, just so we can just so we can move on. Yeah, happy it was, to move it was moved by it was moved by the deputy. But all those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. All right, that's 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 removed. But we've also got the time. Adjourn now. No, it's closing the meeting. Just oh right, right, right. take a break. Okay. All right, we'll take a ten minute break then, and we'll get some Tucker in us. Yeah, poor old business. Come on, let's go and get something to eat. I'm going to take a bite. I'm going to get home.
we'll um, re-up the meeting with us. 5.15 Maryville Esplanade. Any comment or question? I'm happy to move it. I think it's okay. Is this okay, yeah. Director? No. Yep. Fundamental error here. Okay. I'll move it. All those in favour say aye. Aye. I can say no. Carried. Um, that's it. We move to point two. So happy to move that. Advertising report. Any comment? Um, I, I believe um, Miss Abe is uh, <coughs> fully reviewed it and <laughs> <laughs> has. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'll just mention one application. There's uh, item number seven is a dwelling um, with a works value of $1.6 million, which might have jumped out to elected members. It's um, a four bedroom house with a pool, so it's, it's not um, over the top, but there's an extensive driveway, so that's added to the, the cost of development there. I've got a few questions, but I would defer it until the next time. Thank you. Okay.